Go live! We are live, live, live. Yes, we are live, live, live. On brew hoo 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 ships. Yes, we are live, live, live. On brew hoo 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 ships. And I am possibly he suffering from iron brew withdrawals. Yeah, we are live. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? <laughs> So let's see, what we're we talking about today. Well, we're talking about various admirals, we're talking about all sorts of things. And as usual, we are talking naval history. But it's brew ships, and it's not going to be a pure question session, but I have adapted it because I have a feeling that with what's gone on with Australia, with submarine programs, with the lovely French doing what the French are doing, and also my own series of Chiefs of Staff of the Excess Navies, I could be dealing with quite a few questions this time. So, I have got some books, but I'm also here for the questions. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you, Jack Ray! Let's start this ball rolling. <laughs> the pizza's ready. <laughs> I didn't think it started for another half an hour. Um, that you know, I think it starts at 6. Oh, it's supposed to be scheduled for 6.30, but, well, you know. Brew ships, I'm sure, is scheduled normally for 6, so I must have scheduled it wrong. So that's on me. I scheduled it wrong. Ah, well. <sighs> I've started it already. Well, uh, and to be fair, I am suffering from iron brew withdrawals, and I'm not opening the bottles without you guys watching because it seems rather cruel, you know, when you're all doing all you're doing. So here you go. You've got can't go it. You've got pizza. I'm now jealous. I had a very nice beef casserole though for lunch, so I can't really complain. Um, and <laughs> Jack Ray, I'm very very happy with the super chat. I have to admit because um, yes, uh, Iron Brew is currently in short supply, in very very short su uh, supply around the world, and as such. We currently seem to be feeling a national shortage, which has meant that I am currently having to order my supply from Ocado. Now, for those who don't have Ocado, it's basically the home delivery version uh, system that uh, that gets you um, the lovely people at M&S. And the lovely people at Waitrose. So it's not exactly cheap. But they're the only people who stock Iron Brew at the moment. So, you might have also guessed, considering how high this is, and there's no shelf here, that I have had to buy 20 one and a half litre bottles of Iron Brew. So currently, before I start drinking it, I have 30 litres of Iron Brew in my possession, which should last me, I think, about two weeks. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's move that back to. There have been worse things that have in life. Ah, well. So, as long as everything's working, and you guys are hearing or hear me, we will start off this one. And we'll start off by having the usual introductory chat. And the usual introductory chat today is going to go something along the lines of, the world is a little insane, but I have had some interesting questions. And one of those questions that has come through most of it is people ask me if I'm going to do the Allied Chiefs of Staff. Yes, I will. I will be doing the Allied Chiefs of Staff at some point. Um, it's fun. And allows me to get into stuff and allows me to talk about stuff. But 
I do think I need to do some sort of overarching explanation of the Japanese at some point. Because, and I don't claim to be a, the first person to realize this or someone who's breaking any special ground or anything when I say this, but I think there is often a big misunderstanding about Japan their construction policy and their, you know, their whole sort of reason for going to war. And I say this knowing that I have just re-recorded tomorrow's video for about the fourth time. And so you've got now got the fourth version of tomorrow's video, which is going to be, which is now uploaded and is going to be coming out. And I'm going to re-record the Holzenhof video. Um, the... Yontai video and uh, the Yonai video is uh, is done and it's been left up there. The Bagazi Bagazi um, video is that's possibly one of the ones which is going to cause the most shock and interest amongst you all because, and I say this in the nicest way, imagine there being a person. Who is, even though he's retired and in his 80s, that the fascists in Italy are so scared of that after they arrest him, they release him almost immediately and tell off the people who arrested him. Because they are that scared of him, even though he's ill and practically close, he, he, he's pra he, he dies not that long afterwards from natural causes. He's that, uh, but he's that much of a cultural touchstone in the armed forces and in the Italian politic that they do not dare touch him. Hello, Brent Paulus. Insert diabetes joke here. Uh, I'm being quite good, actually. I've cut out pretty much um, everything barring iron brew. I, I, I'd say my only vices, which I really have, are iron brew. And I'm allowed one pack of Haribo gold bears a week at the moment. Otherwise, I drink water, and I'm being good on the whole carbohydrates thing, and I'm starting back at the gym this week, so, um, yeah. And iron brew, I will probably try and cut down a tad. Brew ships will be iron brew heavy, but other times I will try and be good and not drink it quite as much. Going to ask you, God, he's singing again. Yes, I am. Hello, Rick Vasava. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, M35 Benvids. Hello, Vaden Prize. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, Wayne Borian. Hello, Brent Paulus. Hello, Yickers. Um, Jack Ray, have you ever used a Deep L translator as alternative to Google Translate? I have tried using that, and it so far hasn't been that helpful, but that might be the way I was using it. So I'm going to have another go at it. The narrator. It feels very weird to see history in the making with the Arcus Pact. Seeing formed four days ago on the Wikipedia page feels so surreal. <laughs> Welcome to the real world. History doesn't ju doesn't just stay neat. History's always happening, and honestly, the Orcus Pact. That's the natural progression of Five Eyes and the technology work. And the moment you're adding in nuclear, see, you're sharing nuclear power, nuclear secrets. They were going to need to do a different framework. They were going to need to evolve the Five Eyes framework something slightly more. And that's why you have the Orcus Pact. Yikus, going bears are my secret. They're a weakness. They're everyone's weakness. They're just good. Hello, Michael Patton. Hello, Bug Guy 8829. Hello, Constant Now, as I possibly said at the beginning, the reason I look hot is I've just watched, I walked two dogs in the sort of warm, muggy weather you get before a very big thunderstorm. So if a very big thunderstorm happens in it, you know why. And you've been warned. Now, the getting on with the thing, uh, with the whole issue which we have with the Chiefs of Staff coming out, as I said, there was this Italian admiral 
and he's just seriously he's fast becoming a bit of a hero of mine um do i have a blank slide on him that i can pop up let's see if i can find a blank slide can i find a blank slide on him just a picture of him <laughs> if I go back to that, I can find a blank slide on him, and I can quickly talk about him without revealing too much of the discussions to come. Because I don't want to, you know, too much highlight the punchline too much and you know give you give it all away before you watch the video oh yeah that's the one i want to i want slide 70 doesn't matter whether it's a new version or the old version the slide 70 is the way to go now i want you to look at this Fine bearded gentleman who, frankly, both me and Drakinifer, without realizing it, ha seem to have copied the sartorial elegance of. Because this is why this man is so scary. Look at this sartorial elegance in personification. He is literally me and Drak. He we could be him. He is just you know he is us to a T. And he is called Ernesto Bazzagali. And he's head of the Italian Imperial Admiralty Staff, 1915 to... No, not, that's not him. He's head of the Imperial... Uh, the Admiralty Staff. He is Chief of Staff, let's see, till 19... Uh, yeah. He is Chief of Staff from 1927 to 1931. Uh, he resigns as Chief of Staff when Italy announces plans to retire two battleships, 12 cruisers, 25 destroyers, and 12 submarines, uh, or 130,000 tons of naval vessels in protest. In 1933, he becomes a senator and a member of the Commission of Finances and all sorts of things. Um, he, he dies in September 1944. And he, what, uh, pretty much from his estate uh, in Montevarchi, near uh, Monacini, he manages to annoy Benito Mussolini non-stop by opposing Italy joining the Axis powers, adjoining their subsequent entry into World War II, and basically opposing everything Mussolini does. And he does it, and this is what I love so much about him. He's in his late 60s, and he is having fearsome fights with Mussolini. It's just... This guy is just cool. And he looks good. I mean, you... you, you the, 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 that whole facial expression and that that whole you know ensemble he looks good hello ralph shepherds hello tanif belka hello felix b hello sean mack hello blue shirt buddha hello tom golding even it's clock i reckon this will be a great one sorry i don't have my copy of cable to hand <laughs> wayne boring there's other stuff in seeing happening in seeing happening with us allies Take the initial case of the U.S. selling Canada their top-line radar for our uh, Frignauts. It's uh, being publicly talked about. Yeah, they're in nicest way. You, you are having America is having to upgrade their allies and help their allies upgrade. And I think actually this is going to sound terrible. I think this Orcus deal helps out both Britain and Australia because, especially if, as I suspect, because we have the spare production because we. Uh, and America doesn't because they're maxed out in Virginia. They build the first two in the UK and then the rest get built in Australia. One or two in the UK. I think they might be used as an excuse to build some more, ba uh, some more, well, enhanced uh, astutes, basically. Uh, sort of a uh, in between between the SNR 
the SSNR and the Astute. So an Astute Batch 3, which will basically be an Astute with the new reactor in and a VLS module um, tucked in. And basically, uh, a few of those for the Royal Navy would be quite... Uh, about three or four of those for the Royal Navy would help with us, our presence in the Pacific and in the high north with Russia and the South Atlantic, because we need to... Okay, we maintained... A, 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 we said we couldn't go below a number six to maintain one in the high north, one to protect the nuclear deterrent, and one to protect the South Atlantic. So that's where our three submarines that are available, operational at one point are in. Now we're taking on a Far East commitment. We have a commitment to have a submarine in Southeast Asia region pretty much as well. You can't do that on seven. You can't square that circle. You can just about do the high north and the nuclear deterrent with four vessels to keep the two out there because it's quite close to the UK. So you need about three, possibly four more subs for the Brits. And the easiest way of us starting our production line and share is if we're sharing the cost with someone else. And that helps out both sides. Hello, Zachary Gherkin. Tom Wilson, I have 30 liters of iron. Me, ooh, it's going to be a long live. <laughs> if I was drinking all 30 liters of iron brew, we could be here for the next few hours. Who is the guy reclining? This is a photo taken when he's in it, it, he's in Japan, and it's aboard a Japanese naval vessel in Yokohama before sailing to the Battle of Port Arthur. He's actually out there. He's at the Battle of, uh, Battle of Port Arthur. He takes part in all sorts of things in the um, in in the Russo-Japanese War. I'm not quite sure if he actually made it to the Battle of Toshima. There is part of me which thinks he possibly did. I, we know he witnesses firsthand the bombardment of Port Arthur, and he was assigned as military attaché in Japan and to, to Tokyo in Japan in May 1940. He was an official foreign observer in the Imperial Japanese Navy during the Russo-Japanese War, so he was allowed to wear his uh, uniform and would be recognised as an observer by the Russians if he'd been captured by them, so he would have been fine that. And after the end of the war, he's actually receives a very special distinction. He's received by the Emperor Meiji of Japan and is receives the Order of the Rising Sun before his return to Italy. He is considered incredibly respected by the Japanese. And this is in 1906. And if you think about it, he's born in June 1873. So he is. What? 33, well, 32, nearly 33, not quite 33 years old. He's younger than I am at that point. Well, he's younger than I am now, if that makes sense. And, you know, he's just, he's cool. He is really cool. Hello, Nautical Wolf. <laughs> Stuff doesn't. Dr. Luke. Uh, hello, Dr. Uh, hello, Stafford. I thought it was a one thirty start. <laughs> apparently, uh, well, uh, apparently I put in for 6.30. Normally, I always think these things, a brew ship starts at 6. So I turned up and started at 6. And I put 6.30. So that's on me. I do apologize to everyone for that one. Hello, Dirt Squad. And the Senate can hear it. How effective would a modern day fire ship be against a convoy? It would depend what you're sort of making a modern day fire ship of. If it was a sailing boat just on fire, not that effective. If you're talking about, I don't know, loading a merchant ship fully with explosives and managing to get in the middle of the convoy to blow up, then that would be very, very effective. But there are two points against that. One, if you're that loaded with explosives that you're that dangerous, 
you get hit by any of the escorts, you're going sky high. And two, you know, any convoy worth doing probably already has you know, uh, has the enemy's own ships loaded that much of explosives, so you might as well just put your efforts into blowing them up. Wayne Boren, add in the minor detail that Canada also needs to replace our subs, and we know we were, uh, we definitely know that their only free subs ain't safe. Nope. Hello, Frank Sato. Hello, Kenrick Johnson. But Gate Eternal, would the new Australian subs get Tomahawk VLS or the new bigger VLS, like the last of uh, Virginia's sort of new hypersonic missiles? Uh, the new VLS, they, they are definitely going to get Tomahawks. They might get tubes that allow them to do hypersonic missiles, but that's a different thing. And you have to remember the it's listed for the Virginias, for the next generation of Virginias, but they haven't yet built them yet. So that's from who is that? That is uh, that uh, that is Ernesto Bazzagali, and he is going to be the last admiral looked at in the current Chiefs of Staff the Axis Navy series. He's going to be part fourteen. And basically, I just wanted to put him in because. He scares everyone on the Axis side. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, the, the, there is one story which I read of him, which is that at one point the king, uh, and the king was considering replacing Mussolini earlier. But, and they said, you know, they basically asked the king, well, you couldn't get anyone. And the king said, I could ask Berzi Ali. And they all went, well, if you asked him, yes, he would... Um, Yes, yes, um, he would probably, um, yes. He didn't, because the king decided that it was, uh, you know, you should uh, go with the democratic choice. Don't say, hello, doctor, sorry I'm late. Uh, have we started yet? Just starting, sort of. Uh, that was good. I was at Portsmouth Dockyard for the first time yesterday, went on Victory and Warrior. Struck me that Victory was designed to fight wars, War is designed to look scary. Um, Warrior is also designed to fight wars. Warrior looks scary, but Warrior is designed to fight wars. I would say Warrior is more designed to fight wars than some of the subsequent Ironclads are. But you have to remember, she's designed to fight wars in, I would call, frigate style. And that's the thing. Victory is very much a battleship. Warrior is very much, she's got the firepower of a battleship of her age, but she's more a frigate in her style and shaping, and that's why she looks like she does. Eric Vassalva. France seems to be a tad upset about the uh, sub cell of Australia. Is this justified? There's a yes and a no. They can be justified at being upset because they weren't in they weren't informed. You can say properly. But it's been going bad enough that even they've been questioning the project with the Australians. So they must have realized there were problems. And there seems to be a fundamental miscommunication. I've said this on a couple of videos I've recorded now, and I've, so I'm going to be repeating myself. Big, that video's not come out yet, so I'm going to be repeating myself before I say it. But in, with Australia and France, and I, when I say France, I mean naval group, there seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding what was important. Australia was prepared to accept Subs which didn't quite fit the requirement as long as they were built majoritively in Australia, which is why they signed up to a deal which originally was 90% build at about 40 billion Australian dollars. This has been renegotiated to eventually now 60%. Uh, it was renegotiated in sort of 20, this was, that was 2016. In 2019, Naval Group negotiated it down to 60%, $90 billion, and, um, okay, fine. 
they were rumors that they were going to try and renegotiate again. Remember, they haven't actually cut any steel, done anything yet, and set and build them, uh, you know, change it down again. There was a debate as to whether it was going to go down to 40% built in Australia or even potentially as low as 30% built in Australia. But the trouble is, every time it's gone down the construction level done in Australia and the price has gone up. The Australians are prepared to pay through the nose for something to be built in Australia to employ their own people to help their own infrastructure. They are not prepared to pay through the nose to support the French in, 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 uh, the French people. That's perfectly fine. That's their political position, and that's a perfectly fine political position. The French are quite rightly upset about the way they've been told about this, but I would say the fault lies in a fundamental miscommunication on the signing, because the naval group themselves even start to realise that the submarines they're building for the, for the Australians are not what they need. They need SSNs. But the reason the Australians had gone for SSKs, for diesel submarines, is so they could be built on Australia. And the, 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 I keep getting tweeted back at me, various French people point out, well, we've been offering them SSNs and this. And I sit there and go, yes, but you don't understand. The point was to build it in Australia. That was what the Australians were paying the premium for. That's why they were prepared to pay through the nose. Because once you start looking at that over a class of eight boats, and you're talking about 90 odd billion dollars, that's a lot of money for eight vessels. And I think at one point there was a, there's a figure was passing around, it was 96 billion Australian dollars for eight vessels, which is an absurd amount of money, and I'm hoping that one's, that one's including infrastructure and everything and all other stuff building. But it's just not going to work. It's, it, the Australians aren't going to take that. So what the French thought they were, that Australians were buying, were the subs. What the Australians were really buying was the programme to build the submarines in Australia, and that's what the Australians understood. And this is the fundamental point. Once you have a fundamental misunderstanding of what the contract's about at the beginning, nothing ever since has ever managed to get it to grow back closer. Because the French have kept trying to go, we're delivering, we're going to deliver the submarines, we're going to deliver the submarines. And the Australians are going, where's the programme? The French are going, we're going to deliver the submarines. The French, go, the Australians are going, where's the programme? And this is what's happened. And now, of course, with... China getting, especially if you're Australian, so perceptively more, mm, how am I put this in a polite term? China is getting aggressively more assertive as far as Australia is concerned, which from both sides is complicated. And Australia is responding to this by strengthening up their defences. And one of the things they're having to look at is their own vulnerability to hypersonic and long-range missiles. Which means they want to push their defence bubble out further. And if you're going to push your defence bubble out further, that means you want your submarines, which are the outer line of Australian protection, to operate further away. And if they're operating further away, that means they need to get further away, operate there for longer, and hopefully get there faster. Which eventually leads you down to nuclear power. So this gets us into the nuclear power scenario. The Australians conclude a report which says they need nuclear power. They're looking at the French. They no longer trust them to build the program in Australia. And because of what's happened with the SSK program, primarily the French are saying, because there's such little industry and so little technology and capability in Australia, which means it's not going to work in Australia. So in which case you start going around, well, who do we operate with mostly? We operate mostly the Americans. We want to buy their technology, their sensor systems, their computer systems, and their weapon systems for our submarine anyway. That's been part of the deal from the get-go. Okay. But the Americans aren't going to sell a hull, because the Americans don't sell nuclear hulls. They don't sell nuclear reactors. They don't do that. Who does? Hello, the Brits. The Brits and the Americans work together on nuclear reactor technology. Most of our systems are interchangeable to a large degree, and we're able to work together to, an, uh, to a great extent. So this is what's produced together. We have an ally in Five Eyes who needs this. 
we have already got existing agreements which share high level information and high tech information. And I've done a whole thread about this on Twitter. And therefore, this just takes that a little bit a step further. So, yes, the French have arguably been uh, have been arguably been a bit shorted on this, but the French also, to an extent, saw it coming and have been their own worst enemies. Because I can guarantee them this: if they had kept their promise and managed to keep at least seventy five percent being built in Australia and got some steel cut already, the Australian political class, no matter how much the Navy said, this isn't what we need, would never have batted an eyelid and just kept paying the bills to get them delivered. Hmm. Um, Frank Sonner, I thought there were British observers at Toshima. There were British observers at Toshima. There were lots of observers. There were American observers at Toshima. There were British observers at Toshima. I think there were some German, French, and Italian as well. This Italian gentleman as well at Tsushima. Um, that's good. But officers had far more luxuries than victory. Um, spa a space that could have been assi assigned to making war was assigned to giving officers a bit of luxury. It was also assigned to deal with the presence mission. And that's the point about war. It does do the presence mission as well. Frank Smart, LNG tanker. Yeah, that 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 that's definitely a, uh, <clears throat> a a a fire ship waiting to happen. Hopefully, they never set one of those off in a tight, confined space, like a harbor or a canal. That would not be good. Hello, DGB40. Senator Kinnear, was there ever a situation like uh, with the launch of Dreadnought, but then it turned out to be just a fluke? Um. Uh, you you have to explain that slightly more. What what do you mean by the launch of Dreadnought? There were a few interesting events at the launch of Dreadnought, but are you talking about Dreadnought as in launching of the battleship and it changing the world to an extent? Yes and no. Warrior, you can go back. At, there's a few. The, the first nuclear submarine being launched was a pretty big thing. And of all, why? Yeah, didn't they recall the ambassador? Even I was like this bit far. Uh, Especially considering what a debacle it was, but I haven't paid that much attention. And yes, the French have withdrawn the ambassador from Australia and the one from America. They've also cut. They've also cancelled a dinner with the president of Switzerland because they decided to buy the F thirty five rather than the Eurofighter or Rafael or um, Raphael. So, um, in the nicest way, Macron. I, as said, I can understand them being a bit miffed, but I think there is a case of they could be going a little bit too far. I was prepared to be sympathetic to an extent. That extent was say, recalling ambassadors. That seems to be taking a bit too far. That's good. The problem with the naval group Australia deal is the Australian Civil Service negotiating an absolute take of a contract. Nothing about a percentage of Australian build or cost of the contract. There is actually stuff in the contract. It's in the memorandum of understanding. And there are various restrictions within that contract within the contracts and the things around it. Uh, there's debates about various points of what at what points there are, and there are political requirements, but um. There's lots of things negotiating. You have to remember the Australians are fairly good at contract negotiations. They they have fairly good trade negotiating teams. I was asking. That was good. My understanding is that the Australians have been trying to arrange contact between Morrison and Macron for weeks, but Macron avoiding as he knew it was about the cancellation. I have also heard that Macron has been dodging Morrison's calls. Hello, Nook. I'm lucky. Are we supposed to be starting at 7.30, meaning now? Um, normally, I start the... I do the brew ships at 6. I programmed it in for 6.30, probably because... Ah, now I remember why I programmed it for 6.30. I was supposed to be driving back from Cornwall today. So I had programmed it in for 6.30 just in case I was late. So I'd given myself an extra half hour. And of course I haven't been in Cornwall.
So that's it. Sorry about that, everyone. Mm-hmm. Kenrick, they did have issues over the Eurocopter Tiger. Um, Trimac, domestic production is what sunk the Japanese bid. If the Aussies just wanted boats, they would have bought Japanese. To an extent, yes. That's good. The Ministry of Defence negotiated with Naval Group via EY. EY negotiated the contract having employed the person who wrote the contracting process directly from the Ministry of Defence. There was a whole load of contrary on straight over the contract. Ministry of Defence refused to publish the anti bribery and corruption documents because it it would EI would look corrupt. All that is true. Hmm, all that is true. I also bet the entire impetus was from the Minister's Office, not the Civil Service. The Civil Service will always recommend the cheap option instead. Hmm. Not sure. So, Doctor, which books are we starting with? We are starting with some Admiralty books. Because we're looking at various Admirals and discussions. But, as said, I thought I would end up answering questions. And... As such, it seems sensible to answer the questions. I had the pile of books earlier, and I put them, well, earlier this week, and I put them together, and where have I put them? That's, because I put, ah, there's a, there they are. <clears throat> Hello. Let's start off with this one first. Oh, right. Uh, okay, um. Darius Rodowski, the French 74 cannon third rates? Um, nice ships. Tend to be very, 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 very sleek lines. So fast built, but uh, so they could sail places quick more quickly. But tended to get more damage when they were there. And so needed a lot more work. Right. Seneca Nero, everyone holding their breath and thinking that will be the next big thing, and then the concept of the ship turns out to be terrible. Oh! <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, good God. Half to the construction of the Royal Navy in the 1850s and 1890s? Um, <laughs> basically, any of the central battery ships, HMS Inflexible, HMS Captain, all those vessels, they're just, yeah. They weren't the next big thing. They really weren't. They really, really weren't. Um. Thanks, Sam Thompson. Have you heard um, that the uh, Chinese said that if we, if Canada uh, unelect, don't elect Trudeau, we could apparently face counterstrike for them? Well, that's a guaranteed way to cause Trudeau fun in election. <sighs> there is throwing your way around and there's not getting involved, and it's a nice way it's better to keep quiet. Uh, Bijan, Mr. Macron is sounding a bit like Mr. Z, anger and last, lashing out of some foreign policy. I, I honestly, um, Z tends to be slightly more controlled. Uh, it seems Macron is having. I think Macron's having a tough time at the moment with the domestic elections going on.
Hello, Eric Kaufman. Terrence Rossi. Uh, Jive Turkey made great videos on the whole attack class debate and has a very, has a very endorsing attitude towards Australia going nuclear. Even off his service advisor in operating SSNs. That would be lovely, but I think, honestly, they are not going to have a shortage of advisors. <laughs> I have a feeling they have been only hiring wholesale from Royal Navy and the US Navy. He's going, hello, do you have any officers who are uh, have to deal with up and out? And the US, Na US Navy will be going, yeah, we have all these officers who are up and out. Oh, good, we're hiring them all. Carte blanche. Royal Navy, you any uh, uh, up, up and out who are good? Yeah, these ones. We're hiring them all. That's what, yeah, I, I agree. They'll, they'll call them back for a couple of weeks. They'll have a nice holiday at home, get to see their families back in their France, and then they'll be sent back to their postings. Hmm. Uh, Stafford, I have heard about China's foreign minister making that statement, and it seems to me a very crass statement, if true. Usually China is slightly more, um... Um, how do I put this? They're slightly more tactile than that. Right then. Back to an old favourite. And I'm picking this book because, in part, I don't have to read it out, but in part, I can talk about it. Admirals by Andrew Lambert. Now, hands up, this guy was my is my it was my PhD supervisor. Uh, he is the Lawson Chair of Naval History at King's College London, and as far as naval historians in the UK are, co are, are concerned, he is the closest thing we have to a, especially with loss of Eric Gove, the king who walks among us. Um, he is amazing. And one of the things you learn when you read through this book, and you read through the admirals and descriptions of it, and very carefully, he stops where he stops. He stops in and with Andrew Cunningham. He starts with Lord Howard of Effingham. He goes through Robert Blake, James II, George Anson, Samuel Hood, John Jervis, William Parker, Godf uh, Geoffrey Hornby, John Fisher, David Beatty, and Andrew Cunningham. He goes through all those admirals very specifically. You get a very nice feeling from it. You get a very nice emotion from it because you learn with the Admiralty and how the admirals learn and how the admirals develop. But I've been reading this book a lot lately and I've been looking at the modern world and I've been, of course, thinking about the Chiefs of the Star for the Axis series. And more and more, I think, there are definitely more dangerous ideologies which have been used to govern countries. But I think there is no, a none more dangerous an ideology for naval officers to adopt, for any nation to adopt than the risk fleet theory. And I say this because of two fundamental reasons. 
One, if we consider nations that have employed the risk fleet theory, and I would argue that Germany and Japan, Germany in the 1900 and uh, World War One, and Japan, I would argue, is certainly looking at heading in that direction prior to World War Two. They have always been trying to grapple with significant infrastructure issues in terms of affecting their construction and affecting their procurement. But also, and this is the point I make, the whole risk fleet idea, idea is based on a very vicious Darwinian ascent approach to world and international relations. Because let's put it honestly, the idea of the risk fleet is that you build a fleet which is big enough that should the your opponent defeat you, even if they are the largest navy in the world, they will then be so weak that other nations will be able to destroy them. You're basing this on, and basically, Turpit is basing this on the theory that if Britain is made suddenly weak, that... France, Russia, America will not be able to help themselves but descend upon Britain in a fury of bloodthirsty ogre to kill if Britain loses their loses a large portion of their navy fighting the Germans. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of the way international relations work. It's also a fundamental misunderstanding of naval infrastructure because the point is, yes, they could lose a lot of ships, but... What happens if that ascent doesn't happen immediately? What happens if it's two years later, or three years later, or four years later? At the rate the Royal Navy can build ships, they could be rebuilt to the point at which the French don't matter and the Russians don't matter, and even if all three combine, they've got to de still deal with a far larger navy than they have. And it's the same problem for the Japanese. Because the idea is you build a fleet which is powerful enough that if America attacks you, what? Britain's immediately going to turn on and go, oh, You're weak! We will destroy you! But that's not what Britain or America are likely to do. Or Britain does that and then America's going to... It's, that's not a likely scenario. And this is the whole problem. The risk fleet strategy is entirely based on a foundation of misconceptions. But you have two whole generations of officers going through being taught that this is a theory akin to holy dogma. And this is the problem. And this is what makes reading this book interesting because if we think about it, the Royal Navy never comes up with a theory. The Royal Navy just is. Why does it ever need a theory? It uses Corbett, it uses Mahan, it uses Richmond, it uses Cable. Whoever is available, they will use quite happily. But they never come up with a theory. They are the largest navy in the world. At no point do they need to come up with a founding dogma other than the Royal Navy. Well, I've answered my own question. Terry Pratchett writes in one of his books, well, it's really strange in Discworld. Dwarfs don't have religion. That's because being a dwarf is a religion. The German Navy, and to an extent the Japanese Navy, needed a religion to build themselves around. In the face of the army, in the face of the other things, they needed a religion. And risk fleet theory, Tirpitz's ideas, became that religion. The Royal Navy didn't need a religion to build its way around. You have been within five feet of a Royal Navy, it's even to this day, being in the Royal Navy is a religion. It is. And that could be upsetting a fair number of people on here, so let me explain. A religion has a holy gospel. A religion has a certain form of, pra of practice and worship and how you act and, you know, morals and ethics. And usually has a sort of a way a viewpoint on the world. If you look at the Royal Navy, that it has that. And arguably the US Navy gets it as well. They go a longer way around getting it, but they do get it. 
But saying that, I go back again. I, I, I'd argue risk fleet ideology is probably the most dangerous ideology to have ever entered international relations or naval thinking. Tom Golding, he's a fantastic professor and a lovely bloke. True. Uh. Yeah, I'm familiar with Jive Turkey. They do good stuff. I, can't, I follow a few of them on uh, on the YouTube and Twitter. Vision, U.S. nuclear U.S. nuclear reactor training Zion Lang that happens in my area, Saratoga Springs, uh, such in New York. So I'll likely see sailors from down under in a few years. Yep. I know Stafford. Canada is having its own fund with China at the moment. And there are several thousand other Canadians in China at risk of the same. Either you proceed quietly and wait for the US to do their pl a plea deal with Huawei, or you get several thousand more hostages. Ouch. It's not a good look for China, though, doing that. You know, it's kind of like the risk fleet idea. You can do something. It's like France a moment. You can, but then you're going to be in trouble if you do. Because if you do that, then everyone else is going to start to leave. And that's fine for a while, but no tourism, no foreign... And then there's going to be the fact that people aren't going to be trusting of uh, people coming from China coming to their countries. It, it's kind of like I keep pointing out if the naval group sues the Australian government or anything like that. Yeah, they might win. They might. But if they do, then it's going to raise the cost of doing business with them for other, country, uh, for other companies. And that means they might not get that, but other countries, and they might not get that business. I hate to break it. I the was saying within most dangerous ideologies of the Navy, I was being very careful not to run countries. There are certain ideologies which have been far, far worse for the world as a whole. Hello, Shimmy. Jack Ray, it sounds like Risk Fleet is far more risky for the implementers than anyone else. Pretty much. <laughs> Content around the difference. I'd argue that risk fleet sounds a lot like certain national ideologies in a broader context. To an extent, it is. And um, this might explain why certain nations' navies were far more prone to... Uh, falling into that ideology than other nations were. Hmm. Uh, dear student, I had, uh, the hegemon's religion is maintenance of its position. Pursuit is rational and the inspira and the inspiration. Hmm. Um, Shumak. I feel like the USN, for the USN's sake, is the result of having three exceptionally pro-Navy presidents, and that also happened to be strong wartime leaders in short succession. That did help. I'd also say perhaps the USN forms its religion as a kind of response to the... Well the sheer 
threat of the... Uh, the, the, thing, the thing is, the existential threat to the US Navy is Congress. And I think this is what form, helps form their religion. Good luck, Vision. Got to go back to work. Very busy at hotel. Dave Matthews concert, big wedding, and Mississippi National Guard. All at hotel this weekend. And not enough washcloths. Take care. Good luck. Tom Gordon, the Royal Navy even has its own saints and redemptive Messiah, e. e. Nelson dying for salvation of the nation and the glory of the service. Yes, and its own, if you consider it, its own devil figure, Beatty. Shumak, would you say the Dutch concept of risk fleet was better thought out than other implementations? Pretty much. Because the Dutch weren't thinking of a risk fleet, they were thinking of a tripwire. I enough force that the Japanese had to bring a significant force with them. So A, would attack to detract from fighting other people. Not so much force that they would consider it a threat. And more importantly, the fact is, by attacking the Dutch and having to bring enough force to attack the Dutch and fight the Dutch, they would then announce that they were, fight they were declaring war, in which case other powers would get involved. Frank Spotter, the Doctor C. I'm noticing the UK takes the center of the Orcus deal. Cheeky. We do like being the one in the middle. Uh, Tanif Melink. Uh, Tanif Belakia. Hello. Uh, Tanif Belakia. Uh, Belakia. Thank you. The world is crazy. I'll just sit here and carry on building my RC tribal class. A radio control tribal class is right. Cool. Frank <clears throat> Spotter, Mark Felton has a video about an RC... Oh! I've got a Robin coming to visit me. Oh, it's gone out now. There was literally a Robin which had perched right on the window and then went out. Ow. Um. Frank, Mark Felder has a video about an IJ and a torpedo that were found near the Golden Gate Bridge. That doesn't surprise me. We know very little about the Japanese Navy. We really don't in World War II. And that is a problem. Here is a thing which I, I for years have been toying, and as you know, I'm actually sort of uh, working towards, but it's going to be a while away because it's going to take time to go over all the stuff. A book about Admiral Henderson, which is basically about how he develops, how he's involved in the development of the Royal Navy and what he's sort of building in terms of both as an admiral and to an extent as a theorist, because as a controller, he is shaping the Royal Navy as it becomes. Interesting question I have from people is people when I start talking about that go, so what's his American equivalent? And I go, well, I can list off a couple of admirals who sort of do uh, do the job and sort of share it halfway through. And then I get into the Japanese equivalent and I don't have anyone really. Well, I do have someone. I have someone who I have a sort of idea might have been, might have done it a lot. And was certainly fundamental to the ca construction of the carriers and the construction of the um, Yamato and Moshashi. Yamato Moshashi. So I sort of had, but I can't prove that like I can prove it with the American and the British because we don't have the information. We don't have it there. And this means I'm going to have to spend a lot of time, if I want to write that book, I've got to try and visit Japan and try and track down people who are relatives of those who were involved. That's the problem. That's the thing. I've got to try and track down relatives, relatives and hope they will talk to with me, hope they can speak Good enough English I can understand or they can understand, and that we can 
working these things out together. Because that's my only option. There is very little. I have tra tracked down as many English versions of books as I can for the Japanese and for their admirals. And I am scraping the barrel. I mean, I've ordered one book and that's uh, that, that, that came. There is another book which is on its way, but it's going to take 12 weeks to get to me still. And honestly, when I get that book, I'm tempted, when I get it, if it's in good enough quality, to turn around and do a, a drack. And see if I can't put the money together and get USNI or someone like that else to publish it again because there are that few versions around the world and we can't find good English language sources of the Japanese. And that's understandable to an extent. But the thing is, there aren't even sources being produced in Japanese I can translate. They just aren't. Frank Spider, the movie with Angelina Jolie is Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. I know. I, I, I did. We did answer that. And I am going to be starting a thing where if people would like, I will make Drac sit and watch it with me. And we can go through it. And we can, you know, basically see if either one of us has a functioning liver at the end. Hello, Rapid uh, uh, Hello, I'm late, but have we already talked about the French? To an extent, but I'm sure I'll be talking about them again because I'm sure people ask more questions. Don't got it. It would be so unlike the IGN to send incredibly valuable assets on a one way missions. It would be, wouldn't it? Um, well, if the Americans had led AUKUS, it abbreviates to Yusaka. Not great advertising. I think they went in alphabetical order because K comes before S. So, you know, A, UK, US. Orcus. That's what I claim. Second note, which nation would benefit the most from its world alternative just randomly returning into port today? Probably the Royal Navy. They need the numbers. Although, just imagine the uh, imagine the Chinese reaction if the Japanese Navy in World War II suddenly appeared. <laughs> oh, that would be scary. Dr. C, uh, French Dr. C, opinions on Gomley, Turner, Sprunt, Mitcher, McCain, or North? That's going to be a whole series of itself. Okay. And look, you just need, and need to add painting their ships to their theology. Now, song look as decrepit as the USSR fleet in that is the Cold War. Oh, the Cold War. Yes. What's going on? Is one of your supporters or viewers fluent in Japanese? Actually, one of my colleagues is fluent in Japanese, and one of my friends is fluent in Japanese. So I have lots of people who are fluent in Japanese. And I have... Uh, who I can call on. And I have a smattering... I'm, I'm better at understanding Japanese than I am at talking it. But we'll see. Would returning a Turkish diplomat home via battleship during the Russia, a Russian dispute over the Bosphorus fit this video? 
Mm. Not quite, but maybe another video. Gomli, uh, Sarah Mac, Gomli was the man that puts the largest question mark around Nimitz's near impeccable reputation. He shouldn't have been sent out there. He wasn't fit in his health, uh, health estate. Mm. I have to seal this bag up, otherwise I will eat it all. Gummy bears are just too good. Right, right, sorry. It's hard enough to research in a foreign language with one outfit, much less free. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, well, the, yeah, stony vest. The, uh, the donut, yes. Okay. <laughs> Strike to one for two. In Japanese isn't too bad, no. Right, right, right. You and Drag going full sci fi when talking about future Royal Navy was great. Yeah, we get worse. As we get older, we get worse. I don't know that's my shoot. Mm hmm. Jimmy, I was listening to Section 22 podcast on Bill Trump's. Remember they say they had little to work with, but the Japanese who were looking into the IGN radar had nothing. Pretty much. Mike Van, didn't the IGN destroy most of their documentation at the end of, World War, of the war? Pretty much. Strike one for two. As well as a lot being destroyed, I bet a, lot, a load is sitting in old naval officers and naval officials' houses. That's my betting as well, because I know how more of Royal Navy officers are, and I know how American officers are, and I know how Canadian officers are, and I know how the former Japanese naval attaché was. Oh, God, love him. One of the nicest people you ever meet. Um... I have to say, I, 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 I have developed the same habit, habit with him as I dealt with another friend of mine called uh, Tom Hashimoto. Tom is based in Poland. He's just finished his, his um, PhD at Oxford, and he runs basically the entire economics department in uh, Poland and Lithuania, I think it is, uh, are, are two universities. Very, very smart economist. Um, and he and I were working in Cambridge a few years back, and it was a regular thing that the staff would go down to a pub. And we would go along most nights to be sociable. He'd sit there with various alcohols, and I would sit there with iron brew or coke. And on the way back, we'd be the two sober people guiding everyone back. <laughs> and they were lovely. They were all lovely people, but oh, the goodness me, they were lightweights. And there was sort of, there was Tom sitting there going, it, 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 it's an actual skill. And I was going, yes, it is. Like, the drinking the soft drinks is an actual skill. <sighs> he used to be scared of this stuff. <laughs> he tried this stuff once and he said that was a unique flavour. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, they occasionally. So um, by the way, if anyone wants to know, he has messaged me recently. You can buy Iron Brew in both Poland and Lithuania. He has found stores which sell it. If a merchant ship survived the war, how many times could it cross the Atlantic? Um, well, many of the average times a merchant made it across. How many was the, was maybe been the average time a merchant ship made it across the Atlantic? A merchant ship goes right way through World War Two. The odds are they will have completed an Atlantic crossing there and back within 
every 60 day period. They could have done it six times a year. All those years. Six times their max. From memory. Because they have offloading and loading time. They have waiting for convoys. They have the convoys around the coast to where they offload and unload and all those things. So I think it was pretty much every 60 days they would go back and they would go back and forth. Because it's about a two week journey. It was about a two week journey, I think, for most merchant ships at the speeds they went. So yeah, I think it was 60 days. I think it was in every 60 days they'd have gone back on the forwards. So the challenge is finding obscure Japanese books published in the 50s and 60s. That would be challenging, and very challenging, as the Japanese people aware of those books are now very old. Yes, and trust me, I am trying to track them down. <sighs> okay, Shimmy. Good luck with photographing the moon. What is the point of the IJN destroying stone documents at that point? Hide their secrets from the enemy. We don't know how technologically advanced the Japanese were. So every time someone sits there and tells you the Japanese weren't advanced and weren't capable of this, that, and the other, tell them we just don't know because we don't know what their materials were. We have no idea what they're developing because they destroyed it all. That's what I was thinking. That does sound good. Also, a nice movie about Ozel will always be appreciated. As David Brennan said, they spit their last breath at V. To the Americans, I would deny it. I would. You deny the enemy everything you can. That's only what they were doing. Look, I liked the radioactive glow the Iron Brew had on one of your trip lives. The one with the plastic champagne flute. Oh, that was good. That was good. You angle it just right. So Japan may have, Frank, sorry, so Japan may have actually built that death ray then. Probably not, but they could well have had some very decent radar. Come on quickly. I have to ask, how did a perfectly good pair of uh, Cessnacks like you and Drac end up Iron Brew fans? Okay, fair enough. You do have Scottish blood. Is there a secret cunning plan to head up the SM up an SMP Navy? No. Um, honestly, I don't know about Drac. I just started at a young age, and you either like it or you don't like it. And if you like it, nothing else does. Nothing else is good enough. Is a good. Enough. So that's what I drink, and I like it. Shrek, uh, Shrek one four two. The ones that will say that the IJ and weren't advanced would change their minds when a long lance introduced itself to the ship. True. Oh, I'm going to make the Iron Brew glass. Anyway, um, next book. And this is an interesting one. And I should have started this earlier. This is by George A. Johnston. It's called Lioness of the Seas. And it's actually printed in 1941. And here is the uh, opening acknowledgement. My thanks are due to the Australian Navy Board for their assistance in various ways and for vetting and passing the manuscript. To an officer of naval intelligence who insists on being anonymous, who gave me access to official records and who score scoured the book for technical blunders. To Captain Collins and the officers of the men of the Sydney, who so patiently listened to my questions and who so cordially answered them. To Mr. E. G. Knox, managing editor, editor of the Argus. Mr. A. Doyle, news editor. And Mr. B. J. Bailey, pictorial editor 
who gave permission to use files and photographs and to the Sydney Morning Herald for permission to reproduce the picture of Captain Collins. To the Commonwealth Department of Information, a government department does a grand job, not yet fully appreciated by Australia. My thanks also, and to my gratitude to those others who helped, not least the use of whom was that shrewd critic, my wife. This is the story of a ship. Let me declare at the very beginning that it is nothing more than that. But because it is the story of a ship of war, it is necessity of a story of many ships. Primarily, it is the story of HMAS Sydney, one of Australia's fleet of five cruisers, and of the adventures which she, had, uh, which she was associated, directly or indirectly, during seven months of war service with the British Mediterranean fleet. Her adventures began as they did for scores of other ships in the Mediterranean, on 10th of June 1940. Mussolini, proud of his modern and well-equipped Italian navy, decided Italy would profit more by entering the war while there were pickings to be had. The British fleet? Poof. Was not the Mediterranean a Roman sea? Were not the Italian warships faster and more modern than the ships of any other navy in the world? Was not Britain beaten to her knees by capitulation of France, the loss of the support of the French navy? So into the Roman arena was tossed the fascist gauntlet. There were gladiators in that Roman arena. The great gladiators, great gladiators of the Britain's Mediterranean fleet. They are willing to fight in, and the months to come, they prove very clearly to, Bene, uh, to Benito Mussolini that they could fight. But only the crews of the ships that were in that fight realised just how hard it really was. All Italian sailors are not cowards. It is wrong, and it is also very bad propaganda, to suggest as the invariable comment on every Anglo-Italian naval clash that the most efficient seamen in the Italian navy were at stokers. Talk about Ionian sea boat races. If we believe such stories, and there is not sufficient grounds for so sweeping a belief, then we can find little to triumph over in the British Navy's struggle for supremacy in the Mediterranean. There was much more to it than that. You will find a lot of stories in this book that speak of high courage displayed by British seamen. You will also find, also, a good many that speak of bravery on the part of Italian seamen, notably the men of the smaller Italian ships, which we would have been proud to claim as our own. The destroyers, Espero, Zephro, and Vega, all lost in battle, were lost gallantly. The commander of the submarine, Galileo Galilei, had every reason to surrender, but instead he faced days of indescribable agony and suspense to escape the alternative, and gave his life in doing so. For the ships of both nations, there was peril and drama in the narrow seas, in the months before Britain at last delivered the hammer blows at Toronto, and began, as Mussolini himself admitted, the long, sad, long, sad story of Italian reverses. At the bottom of the Mediterranean today lie the crumpled, shattered fragments of ships that are once steamed proudly in line of the Italian battle fleet. The blue waters of Mare Nostrum wash quietly over the bodies of Italian seamen. But beneath these ruffled waters lie, too, the battered hulks of British ships and bodies of British men. The sunken ships and dead men are today, as they have always been, the price of admiralty. The Sydney was a lucky ship. She endured more than her share of actions, yet she returned to her homeland with wild one death in battle. One young rating made a confession to me. You know, he said earnestly, we were so lucky that sometimes it scared me. I used to wonder when our luck, good luck would leave us, because I knew that when it did, it would leave us just when we most wanted it. Fortunately, the Sydney's luck held. The idea for this book, oddly enough, came in a commercial airliner flying over the dry plains of New South Wales, far away from the ships and the din of war. I'd been sent by the Argus to cover the Sydney's homecoming. The idea came as I was flying to Sydney. Just a fleeting idea, dismissed a few seconds later. But when I was aboard the ship, I heard the stories of the men, the stories told bluntly, without any striving of effect, stories which brought the peaceful Sydney harbour the indescribable spectacle of great grey ships thundering death and destruction, of spray whipped by knife-like blows and foaming steel decks, of blood and the smell of cordite and the crashing echoing thunder of broadsides. Naval actions lived again. I heard the real story of Calabria, which in the cable reports had been merely a spectacular but rather meaningless trifle to capture headlines one day and to be forgotten the next. I heard of the beautiful dawn in the Dodecanese that was a colourful prelude to war, of a flaming night of star shells and gun flashes in the Adriatic that rang up the curtain of Taranto. I talked with the men, questioning them about their reactions in battle, their feelings and opinions, their descriptions, and by the time I said goodbye to the ship and the men, Three days later, the idea for this book had become more fixed in my mind and much more tangibly expressed in a notebook, crowned with almost indecipherable scribbling. It was not enough. On my return to Melbourne, I approached the Navy Board for permission to go ahead with the job. 
and permission to take extracts from official Admiralty records. Through a good friend in the Naval Intelligence, this was done. But this is not an official record. My reading and interpretation of the official reports are entirely my own and may be quite erroneous. Any man who attempts to write a true picture of a certain phrase of war while the war is still proceeding is a fool. It is almost entirely written from the stories of the men of the Sydney, from the stories they heard from men in other ships and from various other eyewitness reports. This is the story of seven months of naval war in the Mediterranean, from June 1940 to January 1941, and of the part played by HMS Sydney in that campaign. But because teamwork is so essential to the success of any naval operation, the story of Sydney is also the story of many other ships. With a full realisation of all the pitfalls and inaccuracies of censorship of propaganda, of the necessity for keeping wartime secrets, this book has been written to give a clearer idea of the perilous months when Britain was fighting for sea supremacy in the Mediterranean, as seen by the men of one particular ship. It is nothing more than that. It is, as I have said, merely the story of a ship. This is an old book. As said, this is published in 1941. And if you can find a copy of it, get it, because it's worth it. But I wanted to read the introduction today because I know we're talking about admirals, we're talking about walking soft and carrying a big stick, we're talking about the Terence diplomacy. But for all those things, you need to have an understanding of history. You need to realize what the reality was. And the trouble is there are too many jokes. And Drac and me, Paul from World War II TV and a lot of others have all been trying very hard, very hard to make sure the world doesn't forget how good and how capable the Italian Navy was. And that's another reason why I, want, I am finishing my Axis Chiefs of Staff with the Italian Admiral who I argue was more important than anything to creating the Italian fleet of World War II. Because he created the character. He set the example. He is who those officers who we look at in the Italian Navy and go, wow, you did really well. He is the one they were looking up to. Because that is the real thing you need to help form a Navy or any armed force or any organization. You need a hero. You need someone for them to emulate. Plato and its founding myth. That was his idea. And that's true. But when you're forming an organization like a Navy, you need someone for them to look up to within their ranks. If they're talking about someone from another Navy, Nelson, that's wonderful. But that's not going to help form them because that's the British Navy, so that means they're thinking of the British Navy being the greatest. They need someone in the Italian Navy. It's a good book. Hmm. Sometimes I just change my mind and add books in. <laughs> right, let's uh, catch on questions, Graeme. Scorpion is 26511. Hello. Oh, there also merits going on a two to three week vacation to Japan just to peruse through used bookstores and see if you could find any of those other books. Well, you know, if. If the funding comes available and me and Drac can make it to Japan, we we wouldn't say no. Um, Tanith Bellocker, can you recommend a good book on World War II anti-aircraft guns of the Royal Navy? Norman Freeman's Air Defense at Sea book is probably the best one. Um, I have it somewhere around me. Yeah, Fighters Over Fleet by Norman uh, Norman Freeman. This one. Until the um
illustrations comes out by uh, sort of British World War Two, uh, British naval weapons of World War Two um, comes out. That's probably the best one. Fighters over the fleet. Uh, that na British naval weapons of World War Two, I think, is up to volume three. I think volume four is going to be the anti-aircraft weapons, though. Um, it's the John Lambert collection. I'm going to put that down there because otherwise I'm going to knock end up knocking those over. Good lord, that's heavy. Hmm. That's fine. Um. Sean Gregory, if you get to the US anytime soon, let me introduce you to Verna's Ginger Ale. Quite the same deal, that. Harbor Quarter. Uh, Scorpion 26511. Yeah, you probably really would, uh, Robert. Um, do you see, the used Japanese bookstore is called Book Off. It's a chain and it's glorious. I'll look forward to it. Next one, did any nation ever get their torpedo boats to deploy well ahead of to sink the enemy fleet like the Russians were so afraid of? Not really. Not really. I'm trying to think. Um, I think there's a few small actions where destroyers manage to fire, but normally that's submarines occasionally manage it in ambush roll, but not really. That's what I was going to say. They tested one Japanese armor plate after the war, and somehow it was more resilient than the ones used on our class. They had ally material problems, so they went wild with experiments with substitutes. They had all sorts of issues they went they had tried to dealt with. They had their own problems and they tried to come up with solutions. Remember, that every time this subject comes up, I think of Curtis LeMay and our paragraph in case the ones are watching. Play ball by our rules or we'll end you. That pretty much was the trouble. Um, uh, as Carl Gasway says, World War One Adriatic. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But that's very, very confined waters in comparison. You do have some things there. Hmm. I remember that reading a biography of an admiral who was a midshipman on repulse. The situation went downhill fast, and there was a tribal there. I didn't know that. Um, I don't think there was a tribal um, with Prince of Wales and repulse. Let me just check. Forcey. There might have been. I don't think one of the Australian tribals was available. I know none of the British troubles were out there. Um, there was Electra, Express, and Hesperus. So there was an H class and two E class vessels. There was also Legion, um, L class. Encounter, Jupiter. In that area. I don't think there is a I don't think there is a travel destroyer in that area. Uh, uh, Vampire Tenelos That's they're old ones, they're first world war destroyers. No. No, the only the really big destroyer out there is Legion. Legion's the big powerful destroyer. And she's lost to an air attack in 
Robert Rosewick, reading a biography of Admiral... Who, I'll answer that one. Uh, Frank Swallow, is it possible the IGN and Radar fire earlier than we know, but just play dumb to hide their true potentials and the like that? It's more likely they have Radar, but they have it for different things. Um, they say they only had really good nine top dogs. Mm, I think if they'd had radar, they'd have done slightly better. Also, we'd have probably did Skype to it. Because we did have, in the nicest way, we did have radar listing systems on most of our ships. As Juice they definitely were looking in the late 1930s, but the research wasn't funded to develop it like Britain at that time. Um, they developed it, but not. It was more slow. It was a slower pace of development. It's definitely a slower pace of development. Hmm. Don't stress. Postmodernists would uh, go probably go berserk listening to this chat today. Oh. Don't get me started. Um. Raparazzo, this is rather ethnocentric, but could part of the issue of the obsession of the Italians have anything to do with the relatively little exposure to the Americans or the war outside the Mediterranean? Um, yes. But also there is the fact that... If you see bombers coming over Britain in the Battle of Britain, they must be German. World War Two becomes very Germany, Japan, Italy's forgotten, Italy's down the bottom, the ones remembered, and that's a problem. It undermines a whole section of history, because here is the dirty little truth: if Italy hadn't been in the war, Germany would have been a lot easier to beat, because you imagine the resources which the British had to put. To the north, uh, sort of north, north Africa, to the Mediterranean, deal with Italy that they wouldn't have had to put there. Honestly, the Royal Navy, if it hadn't been for the Italians, the Royal Navy could have potentially ignored the French fleet. Potentially, probably not, but potentially. Uh, Read Japanese radar. Mainly making an airborne uh, anti aircraft early warning aerial search radar as far as your task than a surface search no radar. Radar which is actually FC cable, even harder. True. Takes a lot of foundation and infrastructure development. But remember, the Japanese had radar which was accurate enough that it, they could pick out where aircraft were seeding mines in over bays and then go and find those mines which they dropped in the water. Right, Constructors. Deconstruction seems to be the villain of the day, but could be just my reading. Then it comes. Uh, you, Jamie, and Drac take over the first, second, and sea lord, third sea lord positions in 1914, just before the war. How do you fight the war? Same questions for World War II. Possibly a little, a little better question for bilge pumps. Definitely an interesting question for bilge pumps, and one I will put to bilge pumps, but I will attempt to answer it now, in my estimation. Um, I'm just going to send it through to bilge pumps. So it's on our it, 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 it's on our list of things which we've got there. Always the easiest way. And.
So, in answer to that question, if we did that, well, I, I, I'm going to be terrible. Drax the engineer, so I'm nominating him for third Sea Lord in charge of construction. And as I'm answering a question, I'm sorry, Jamie, you're second Sea Lord, you get the personal issues. So I'll take first Sea Lord, dealing with the politicians and dealing with the other, uh, dealing with the admirals and trying to organize them. And let's be honest, out of the three of us, as much as I love you both, if you're watching this, and I'm, I'm sure you will watch this at some point, it is probably better I'm the one that's dealing with the politicians, as I'm less likely to slam them over the head and declare myself Admiralissimo. <laughs> Not unlikely, but less likely. In 1914, fire BT, fire BT, quickly get rid of him. Um, probably don't cancel Argincourt. Uh, convert more of the R class to renowns. So I would probably want at least three, if not four, put into that version. Um, I'd also see what I could do about turning the R class, getting Dracon, converting the R class so they're slightly better for longer term, especially knowing World War II is coming up. I'd probably start working on a carrier program because I would use the bases that we've already got aircraft, and in that nice way, we're going to need to get some policy to get them at sea. And I don't like the idea of ships stopping to recover seaplanes because of submarines. I'd also start on a expansion of the escort program and motor torpedo boat program pretty quickly and i would probably get convoys going from the get-go because that would massacre german submarines in the early days convoys in world war ii well i certainly wouldn't freeze the carrier construction program certainly wouldn't freeze that um What would we do? Probably ramp up carrier construction program. Probably ramp up 4.5 inch gun program. And um, I'd probably start off with that and just go to the yard, uh, go to the armaments factories producing that and go, I want you to build as many 4.5 mounts as physically possible. Build them. And I would start designing basically battle class destroyers as my war, war emergency destroyers from the get go. I would. Sitting there and go, look, I want one double on the back and two doubles on the front. And just keep churning them out and churn out as many destroyers and as many, with many dual purpose 4.5s as I can. I'd almost be tempted to do the same with the um, Dido's and fix their problems by putting them on the 4.5s. Definitely the C class, and those would be getting a double four point five, um, uh, double four point five put in. What else would I do? Oh yeah, the C fire, uh, the the C fire as originally planned would be there. But we'll have a full discussion that one. That was definitely a full discussion. Christian, Duck Clock, you've mentioned the Type 31s and Constellations of Pressure Ships. Are any of our navies really looking at them? I would say the Chinese owe. Oh, 52? Oh, what are they called? Bird Brigades. Are also them. Um, I'd say the French also have these light frigates which they like to toil around, which are basically present ships. The thing is, a present ship is a ship which in, in wartime is going to be a task group escort rather than a picket. But in peacetime, he's perfectly happy to tool around and is a big enough statement of presence without being, uh, without being a threat. And it comes, what does the Italian Navy and, and the Italian Navy look like in 1945 if it does not enter the war? If Italy does not enter the war. Uh, probably by 1945, they would have three, if not four, of the Veneto, uh, Vittorio Veneto class in service, and they probably have some carriers in service. Because Artorio would have probably been in charge for a bit, and he'd have probably got carriers in at some point. Reference wasn't Vampire Travel? No.
Vampire was many things, but not a tribal. Thanks, brother. Dr. C, do you, what are the best ways to tell about RNDD cigarettes? Do you have a good shelf for them? Um, there are a few books which are quite decent. <sighs> yeah, did it. He grabs the book behind him. Literally there. This is how many of these books I have. There's one literally sitting just behind me. T.D. Manning's British Destroyers. Helpful in the front. There is a battle class and a, a tribal class. And it has silhouettes on it. But mainly what you go by is you go by the various pictures. Which give you the silhouettes. There are also various books which are literally books of silhouettes. But for example, pictures like this are usually blacked out to become a silhouette. So that would be your how you'd look at and tell your Kempenfeld class about. And it is quite difficult because the RN do. There are some of the destroyers which are literally just copy and paste. Copy and paste, copy and paste. I don't know, some which are slightly more interesting. HMS Swift. Now that's always interesting because she's a free stack destroyer. And, um, yeah, she's an S-Class, 1917. Uh, transferred to the Royal Australian Navy, is several in 1919. Uh, Stalwart, Swordsman, Tasmania, Tattoo. All transferred to the Australian Navy. Some good pictures, and I said this is the sort of book you use. It's a destroyer book, it has all the pictures in profile. Um, what are the best ways to tell apart the silhouettes though usually i start off by counting stacks and looking at the shape of the superstructure and after that point then i'm looking at the shape of the guns if i am counting three guns and i've got a certain st number of stacks and i've got a certain straight superstructure i know i'm looking at an l or an m class Picking out from silhouettes between them is sometimes slightly more difficult. Sometimes it's possible, but it depends on what you can see. Uh, Shrek 142. If the war started late, a few years later, do you think it would be possible to create Neptunes, or would the issues in the guns and more, more, more auto a supplement it? They've probably sorted them out by then. That's the thing. As said, uh, as I've said many times before, war doesn't accelerate technology. War tends to cause technology that's already existent, existent, existed to be developed and put into service. So if you want autoloaders and those things, stopping war for a few years would actually cause that technology, the research, to go a bit further forward. It would have time for that. And if it has time for the research to go forward, then probably they solve the problems in peacetime, and then when war comes along, it gets implemented. Tom Golding, my theory for part of the reason the athlete gets forgotten is that they surrendered and then switched sides, and of being their army tended to get rather badly beaten in the field by the British Empire. 
Their army didn't do that as badly as you'd necessarily as its rep suggests, but yeah, they didn't have a good war. Frank Spider, Doctor C, Drax's newest dry dock goes over American squadron carrier position World War Two. Could you do something for RN squadrons at some point? At some point, I'm more than happy to. I would want to do a bit of research to talk about them because it depends on which period, and I want to find some decent pictures. I'm gonna do that. I've got to find decent pictures. Um, John Shay. How many topics have you yet to talk on a Bill Trumps? I think we're at episode 64. We've got to record episode 65 for this week coming. And when we started off, we planned three episodes and we had 12 topics. We are now at episode, as I said, 65, and I have approximately on a list about 140 topics. And the thing is, before because we keep deal with current affairs, we kept th keep thinking that the world's going to calm down and we're going to be able to start going to historical stuff. And then at a certain point, you know, there's just not going to be much for us to talk about. And then the French and Australians decide to start mucking around, or the Chinese do something, or the Americans do something, or the Brits do something. And trust me, we haven't even done, we, we've got our Bill of Trumps. We have got a topic, which we thought was going to be the topic for last week, which was literally two stars, operator, not strategist. And all three of us had rants prepared for that. It was going to be epic. It was going to be a takedown par excellence of the idea of an, a rear admiral not being a strategist. And we get distracted. And honestly, that doesn't fit with the rest of what we're talking about. But the Philippines does. And the Royal Navy's future fleet does. Because that's nutty. And so that's what we have. And this is the thing with, uh, and we keep getting suggestions coming in, and we we know we haven't worked through everyone who volunteered to come on our show as topics and proposed topics. We keep trying to get some weeks where we can schedule them to come on, and then stuff comes up, and we have to push them back, and we feel really guilty about that. And it's we we, we love them, we want them on, but we also we have to we're, we're trying to keep the current affairs, and the current affairs keep going crazy. Uh, CG90, Italy's uh, real problem is that their industrial base could not support a long-term total war. Didn't help their industrial complex was also pretty corrupt. Mm, agreed. Repressor, it's outside the realm of this work video, but I was wondering, if a spy was using a co naval cover, what would be the best place to put on, put the sh uh, uh, on the ship to put them? The Vicar. Or as a navy term, the Royal Navy term, the Bish. They can go everywhere. They can talk to everyone, and no, no one notices them moving around. Uh, John Hargreaves, IJN pre-war put a lot of financial support into eyesight testing for their training their men, such as the color blindness. This we use commonly today. The, the little dots and circles came from that period. Hmm. Interesting. Jim Mac. Would it be too late for converting sonar or some of the later R's for small tube boilers? Uh, probably not. As said, we would convert Renown and Repulse came about. We would convert about two more. Uh, Tom de Golling, could I be the officer in charge of provoking the German invasion of Denmark in 1914? Why? Why invade poor Den and get them to invade poor Denmark? Next one. Do you have videos on British harbours? Albert Z managed to find pictures of the fourth bridge. Um, I haven't done any videos on British harbours yet. I'm going to. The Casso, you wouldn't have all the R's built as renowned. It's too late to get all of them. I could get the first four, probably it would be built as R's, but then oh, first four or five would be built as R's. Uh, so I'd have five R's and I'd have five queens in my battle fleet. But then I would have Three renowns, and I'd have Argincourt as my fast fleet under construction. A uh, rapid raise back. Since Type 31s are supposed to be modern day flak escorts, you should talk with BAE about dual mounted 40mm Gatling CRS. I have been talking with them about it. They rather, they rather wish I would stop talking with them about it every time they talk to me. 
Uh, Frank Smarter, what kept the Barham and Malaya from getting modernized like QE? Cost and time. Uh, Sean Quigley, Tom Gogh, also the feeling of the combatants was a bit different towards the Titanians, more of the they're pushed into war by their leader as opposed to na rapid national support for war. Hmm. Hello, Michelle Hines. Um, hello, hello. Am I too late for the flag officers bashing? No, that can come along any time. Right. Greg Sarsi, chance of foreign sales for Arrowhead Type 31. There are a few in options in there. And honestly, I am not joking every time I bring up the idea of New Zealand buying them. Deidre, uh, Super Gen 90. QE and Valiance were completed after war started. Yeah. As Sean Mack put it, there wasn't enough money when there was time, and there wasn't enough time when there wasn't no, when they had the money. So otherwise, they probably would have been yes, because they would have covered then until the Lions started entering service. Just remember, the uh, the King George V was supposed to place the R, replace the R's, and repulse. My clients, I have read the Nimbus staff was fifteen to twenty times smaller than Ike's. When they were were the Axis Navy staff similarly, or were they bloated? It depended on the Admiral. It really depended on the Admiral. Some had far more efficient. The Japanese ones tend to be fairly efficient and fairly well structured. Um, Frank Spider, what determines the order by which the class gets modernized? Which ship's hull looked better? Honestly, that's what they were looking at. They were looking at the condition of the ship's hull. So believe it or not, there were some Queen Lizards which weren't going to be modernized. And the reason they weren't going to be modernized is by the time they would have been up for modernization. Well, they would all be modernized to an extent, but some would receive, were going to receive far more extensive modification and mon uh, modernizations than others. Because they reckon by the time they complete their modernization, the Lions would be coming into service. Ooh. Paul Beswick, Arrowhead has been sold to Indonesia. Contract signed at Desi last week. Yes. Uh, until it's built, I'm not going to really count my chickens on that one, but it could be cool. It's a good one for them. Hence the interesting debate I ended up in on Twitter about what good is an Arrowhead frigate, and I explain it. <sighs> People always want a freaking battleship. So, this book. Game of Birds and Wolves, Simon Parkin. The secret game that revolutionized the war. Nullii Secundus. Christian Oldham entered HMS Orebi's wardroom to a scene of juxtapositions. The gunmetal grey of the walls, with their protruding pipes and wheels, was offset by deep leather armchairs and a raft officers, some of whom were in black tie. John Lamb took an immediate interest in all of them. He handed her a dr uh, oh, uh, he handed her a drink, and the pair holed up in a corner of the room and talked, in increasingly conspiratorial proximity, about their wars to date and all the excitement and cruelty they had encountered along the way. Time, distance, and pressing uncertainties of war had cooled Lamb's feeling for the new, lock uh, new Yorker Jane Watson. Not knowing how long they had together, he began to pursue Oldham. Oldham, however, left the party in a state of some confusion. He was an eligible officer who was clearly interested in her, yet for the past months she had been missing Lennox Napier, an inscrutable captain of the submarine HMS Rockall. Lamb's pressured chase was typical of young men his age at the time. Sure leave compressed the business of living into a few short days. As Montserrat later put it, Living with the unshakable fear of death at sea meant that as soon as you docked, there was an irresistible urge to tell people about it before you went on a convoy and game, or well, uh, we all thought we were going to be killed. Romance was just another way to yet uh, another way to feel yoked, not only to the land, but also the business of existence. Whiplash engagements were commonplace. During the next few days and evenings, while Oribe's repairs were carried out, the pair began seeing each other, and within ten days were engaged to be married. No time was wasted, Lamb wrote in his diary, a dictum to which so many young men and women cleave during the war, where time was so short, so threatened. 
All of them felt a bit mean, mean towards Napier, who, of whom she remained extremely fond, but as she reasoned, these things happened. I didn't feel pressured to get engaged, she later wrote. It just happened. The other wrens at Belfast Castle delighted in the news of their friend's engagement, a happy distraction from the rigours of the plot, where, as Alden put it, they were nightly plunged into frightful arenas where the battles were viewed from a distance, but in which we all we felt an intimate part. Three of Christian's closest friends, who dumped themselves the hag's watch, sent her fiancé a letter of reference, stamped secret read, We've known her for five months and find her honest, sober, kind, and cheerful all times. In fact, she has never been seen in a temper or known to be bossy. She's quite approachable in the mornings, though rather dopey for the first few minutes about after waking. There's been a slight tendency to madness during the past fortnight, but otherwise she's considered normal, healthy, and cleanly. Not knowing how long they had till Aribi was fit to sail again and when Lam would return to the Atlantic, Pear decided for a black tie engagement party, one of the end of the wor world proportion, one of one of end of the world proportions. I love this book. It's all about the staff war. And it's the war which you forget when you read some of the histories. It gets glossed over. The amount of work, and I have to admit, uh, in my own book, which I'm, is coming out at some point, hopefully soon, um, January, I think, is now when it's confirmed because it's all been delayed by containers, etc. I don't get into the staff work much because I'm talking about what the destroyers were getting up to. But the thing is, when we're talking about the Battle of the Atlantic, there are these control rooms on both sides where they are staring down at plots with the information they have, all the intelligence sparked out, the confirmation reports here, this where they think the convoys are going to be, where they think the enemy are going to be, where they think oh, all those things are factors. And they're all plotting and staring around. This is where you start to get this sort of look down warfare. And it's when we're talking about the fleet actions and we're talking about these fleet operations. So, a number of people come back to me going, but do the chief of staff really matter? Well, who decides how many ships an admiral gets? The command in his task group, in his fleet, or her fleet. The chief of staff. The chief of staff who has to go over the plan and go, where do we get the resources from? Can we justify the resources? Do I need those resources for a convoy? Do I need those resources for this? Do I, what do I need re other resources for? And it's a balancing game. And chiefs of staff are incredibly important for this. Because chiefs of staff have to be not just log uh, tacticians and strategicians, they have to be logisticians, politicians. They have to look at the economics. They have to look at the infrastructure. They have to look at all those things and start to work out what they can actually afford to sustain. Which makes, in many ways, chief of staff more important than anything. Rafa Razorback, I got my V-class HMS Vampire confused with my travel class HMS Vampire. If you're going to recycle ship names, at least wait until the war is over. I'm fairly sure there was also a um, yeah, there's there, there, there been a few various vampire ships called Vampire in the, uh, in the Australian Navy. They like Vampire. Of course, there was also um. The USS Bataan that fought alongside the HMAS Bataan, one of which was a carrier and one of which was a tribal class destroyer. I seem to remember in the task group. Nalgar, speed of news cycle clearly means that you need to do two build trumps episodes per week. Don't get me started. Seriously, if you start tweeting that at Jamie, he will possibly forget, think it's real and start doing that. You know, Jamie and Drac would probably be all for two a week. I'm the one who edits it and has to do all the work behind them and get it up. Oh, and argue with them. And then when I say with them, argue with ice of iTunes. Mm. Um. 
Rapper is up. World War II has this ni it has this niche, and Dragon started filling this in. Have you considered talking to authors about their books? I have considered starting that one, and I am going to look into starting that one. I I'm going to have a talk with Drac about how he does his recording, because I did some recordings with Dan Freeman a while back on via Skype, and they worked and didn't work, so it's basically going to have to be some effort to get that together. But I have a few friends who would have said they'd quite like to come on my channel and chat away because they like what I how I do it on my channel. In that it's very much low pressure. We're here to learn, but we're here to learn in a way which includes everything. Rather than a way which is sort of laser focused. Oh my god, the other thing is actually Professor Lowney. He's a good lecturer on the Western Front Association channel. I know he does. He 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 has many good ideas. I, I I keep getting worried because, as me and Drac have both said, if Andrew Lambert ever sets up a um, a channel, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. I think there might have been a blip about 35-odd minutes ago because one of my timers was reset. One is still at two hours, and one's gone back to 36 minutes. Have you started doing graph projections on what your subscriber base will look like in four months? Uh, well, it's three months and um, now, and I, 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 I let's put it this way: I have just about made it to six thousand six hundred and thirty something, which is lovely. And thank you very much to everyone who's helped me get there. But uh, look, and I would really love to get to the thirteen thousand so I can win. Um, but <laughs> it's uh, it, uh, uh, let, let's put it this way: I am not hugely confident that I am going to be uh, that I'm going to win this bet. And I am currently this evening missing, uh, miss, uh, missing my fluffy research assistant, who was supposed to be out with me, but obviously has decided to stay in the war in a uh, warm. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. Let's go back to the question quickly. Although, I can hear something moving around outside, so there might be Fluffy on the way. Um... Frank Spanner, Dr. C, why do you have a tank vest? Because my mom and sister are still shielded, and frankly, I looked at it, uh, I was supposed to be in Cornwall at one point, and then I wasn't supposed to be in Cornwall because we were protecting my mom and sister, and then I had to go to Cornwall anyway to sort out family issues, and then I came back and I thought, should I get tickets to Tankfest? And I thought, no, because frankly, that's putting my mom and sister at risk. Um, but maybe next year. Miles McCaskill, where does one find all the build from episodes? A quick YouTube search only shows two episodes on your cha channel. I, d I have no idea. A simple cast. Um, there should be a link down below, but... <clears throat> it's supposed to be working, it says. It says it's supposed to be working. All right. Um... What is something that you have proven wrong that you are most surprised about? Hmm. Proven wrong. Honestly, I have to admit, when I was going into the Japanese admirals on the Chiefs of Staff one recent, uh, that was the sort of recent one, I was, I, um, I had always understood they were reluctant for war. But I never realized quite how reluctant they were. And I have to say, I 
I think because of what I'd read and where I'd read it, I had a misunderstanding to an extent of the Naval Party and the Treaty Party and Navy. And of course, you get caught up in the headlines of the young, more vigorous officers who tend to try and do assassinations, those sort of things, and their views. And you don't really, re and when you get into the admirals, you find out that the reality is far more nuanced. That both admirals are looking at deterring America and deterring conflict with America rather than fighting war with America because they realize they don't have the infrastructure available to fight that war. But one side thinks it's better to stay in the treaty to deter them. And the other side thinks that the only option is to break the treaty in order to be able to openly build what they need to build to try and deter them. And it's a sort of, it's an interesting question. It really is an interesting question. And it's when you realise that the senior officers involved, especially, are actually quite good friends. And they have these very strong, very focused and well-meaning debates. They are not, none of them are what you would call rabid or anything for war. They're really not. Strike one for two. Seeing as you love the 40mm, would you go for a Gatling or a Volvo type from Bombardier CRS and well? Why? Um, Gatling, and mainly because of barrel wear. It would allow you to cool the barrel more and protect the barrel more. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Frank's matter. So, Warspike was in the best shape? Yes, she was. What is an arrowhead frigate? And could the, uh, and could the Philippines use them? Uh, they're Type 31s, and yes, to an extent. And the same thing that happened to Matrix of London 2. Pretty much. That when you're upgrading ships in a class, you look for the ones which have the best hulls, because you can upgrade the superstructure. Easiest. You're looking, you don't want a ship which is, you're going to spend all the money upgrading the engines and upgrading the superstructure of, and then you're going to have the hull collapse. Or can't take the weight of the upgrades. Thanks, brother. One hour and fifty-five minutes. So I'm running thirteen minutes behind. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Um, although I think Philippines has a couple of new built, new Korean built frigates. That that the Philippines do, and they're buying a few more. They're good frigates. The Koreans are building. Um, Mm-hmm. Frank Sonnet, don't you see, what names would you like to use, uh, would you like to see for the SSNs? If I was the Australians, I'd keep the attack class. I really would. I'd just go for it. Go for attack class SSN. For the Royal Navy... I liked the S-boat names. I'm sorry, I'm a traditionalist, I know, but the Swiss Strid class and the S class in order to are some of my favourite boats, but also then there's the U class. And I, I I would be tempted to go for a mixed World War II class of U and S boats, especially especially if we end up getting more uh, more astute before we get the SSNRs, if we get a sort of an astute batch free as a part way to the SSNR. Which would actually sort of make sense, because then you sort of build the boat with everything in, all, all the with the astute level stuff in, and then you go right then. And the next batch will be the ones which ha we've already got a show. We've got the reactor working. We've got the VLS module working. We've got everything in the design working. Right then, boom! Now we've got that. 
now we add in the uh, the under uh, uh, the under uh, uncrewed undersea vehicles the uvs and see what we can do with them hmm. now let's take a look hello mammy just hopefully you don't get three times vampires in the same fleet you cause some of the crew to get very nervous if they overhear everyone talking about them <laughs> that'd be fun Very saucy. I had to reload the stream about half an hour ago. That would fit. Well, Westwood, given the French reaction to a subcontract, uh, sub what will there be a reaction be if, Bin if Babcock win the Hellenic Frigate competition? Oh, goodness gracious me. <laughs> Look, I didn't expect them to throw their things out the pram quite so heavily as they have in this one, but um, who knows what they'll do. I have great respect for the French. The French government at the moment seems to be reacting more than acting. Doctor on 95. Hi, Dr. C. Do you think that the threat of China would be prudent to turn the Pitcairn Islands down near Zealand into a naval base because we still own that island? I think it would be useful to start putting some facilities there, but I'm not sure how much you could put there and what resources you could. Um... I think if you could add in, I think the most useful thing you could do would be to build a Gibraltar-style airstrip and a little harbour. And if you could start basing something along the lines of a river-class OPV out there, and could stage P8 out to there if you needed to be, then you'd be okay. You'd have enough. Because it doesn't need much to have become quite a useful facility. But if you put too much there, it's going to cost a lot of money. And if you build an airfield, you can make your money back by having 737s go in there and um, drop off tourists and give the island some income other than honey. Which would be useful, because honestly, honey is not a good source of income. It doesn't keep an economy going, really. It's a good benefit, extra benefit, but you know. Uh, Tanef Veloka, how long can the Atreus Queen Elizabeth stay in the Pacific before bits start to fall off? She should be okay out there. She's a well-built ship. <laughs> when she comes back, she'll probably spend some time with Camel Lairds, but I'll leave that to one side. Um. But as Greg Sarsi points out, you would have to build everything on the Pit Canal Lands. As I said, if you built the thing is, if you have an airfield there, and the nicest way, it's seven three seven range from the Falkland Islands, so you could start to do some things that way. It might be useful. Sure, Mac. Is there a the naval equivalent of Canai that admirals try to recreate all the time? Trafalgar. They're obsessed with it. John Shea, has there been a build trance on the Abovian Navy meme joke? Yes, there has been. I'm fairly sure at one point. Okay. Uh, Rev Rosak, did Canaris have a role in the July 20 plot, or was he already gone? Ah, uh, he had a role in it, but he was uh, far enough away no one could pin it on him. Rappraiser, what role do naval attaches play in diplomacy? Well, they basically liaise with local navy and arrange port visits. They are critical for providing estimates of the local fleet and de in, in dealing with local industry. And basically, if your ships are going to visit that port, you need a naval attache in the region because they're the ones who are going to arrange supplies, any day trips for crew, security, all those things we've sorted through them. Oh. Hmm. Frank Spanner, how much would a 16-inch Gatling weigh? Um, you, you, you don't like people that much? You, you really don't like people that much? Um, 
Let me just do a quick check. Uh... <laughs> okay, I'm just... I'm having to actually look up the weights of turrets to figure this, to try and figure this one out. Um, okay. So it's about a thousand kilograms a ton, including a breach. That's about 121 and a half tons. You probably need about three to have it proceed as some sort of gappling. And you could probably three, so you're probably talking about 360, 300, let's say, uh, let's be honest. Once you've got that mechanism, you're probably going to need about 150 to 200 tons to hold it, which means you're probably going to be talking about the best parts of 600 tons and then you've got a turret system to support it and extend it so probably about another 400 you're probably looking at the best part of a thousand tons honestly that is probably what you're looking at for a, ga a 16 inch gatling probably the best part if not more than a thousand tons and that's me using ballpark figures doing off of my head Uh, Jagel, do you like World War II jokes? Have you ever heard World War II picket lines? Honestly, I have heard some really, really bad World War II jokes and some, at some history conferences, some really bad attempts at pickup lines using history. I can honestly say that A, I have never used them, and B, I have long ago come to the, uh, come to the deep held belief, and this has been confirmed in conversations, that one of the reasons why at conferences I seem to tend to end up surrounded by female colleagues chatting away with me, despite being probably the least well-dressed and slightly strangest guy in the room, is because if you make such jokes or such remarks anywhere near me, apparently the look I give can freeze your soul. So it keeps them away. So I am my, my sole benefit is that I don't drink. I watch everyone's drinks, and I can apparently put off people with bad pickup lines just by my mere existence. Mm -hmm. um, Jack Ray, what is the Chinese fleet of today and how does it operate? The Chinese fleet of today is currently... What is the Chinese fishing fleet of today and how does it operate? The Chinese fish fishing fleet is a huge, colossal mass of trawlers. And you can spot them by basically looking at the night... Uh, looking at any of the night pictures of South America, etc. And from above, you will normally be able to see the coastline ringed out at sea at the territorial and sometimes the exclusive economic exclusion zone area by fishing lights, lights of fishing boats all the way around. And they're currently in South America, South America and I think they're also trying to, starting to look towards possibly parts of the ocean. Um, 
They have an insatiable desire for fish. And there are large parts of the world which are now fairly empty because of it. Fish Himes, if in your radar video you showed that after escort commits to Germans, uh, uh, r r that after escort com commitments, the Germans would have had 14 free destroyers. That sounds like only enough for Warspite to play with. What would the rest of the RN have chewed on? There wouldn't have been anything for the rest of the RN to chew on. That was the problem with 4Z. Plan Z well, had serious, serious issues. It really did. Um, Plan Z has so, so many issues. It just doesn't have enough ships in it for Germany full stop. This is the basic problem. The German Navy is... Okay, when we talk about World War II, think about it this way. If France hadn't fallen and Norway hadn't fallen, both of which German war planners were not expecting, they weren't expecting France to fall like it did, they were not expecting Norway to fall like it did, they weren't expecting to win those as quickly or as successfully as they did. They hoped they would, but they definitely weren't thinking about it. And they weren't thinking about those at the beginning of 1939. What does the German fleet do? Because let's say Germany fails to win in Norway. And France becomes a high-tech stalemate. A 1930s version of World War One. Where let's say the let's say the Belgian version of the um the the Belgian version of their line holds. And the Maginot, the Belgian section of the Maginot line holds, and let's say the Maginot line, the section in the Dardan uh, uh, protecting the Dardan uh, the Dardan uh, the the forest. has holds somehow. I don't know. An armoured division gets lost and ends up sitting in front of the German attack and basically just goes bang, bang, bang as the Germans come up some narrow roads. Uh, you know, let, let, let's say that. Let's say a British armoured division gets lost and ends up in the forest. The, the Ardennes forest and is going hello, bye-bye. And so they have, they get held. They they don't win. It just becomes a stalemate. What does the German Navy do? They have barely any submarines. They have barely any surface ships. If they've lost in Norway, they probably lost some of those surface ships. Where do they go from there? Yes, they've now got Denmark. That's lovely. That means they control pretty much access to the Baltic. Mm, but if they're fighting in Norway or, or have lost in Norway, then they don't control... That Denmark Straits, they control one side of the Denmark Straits, and that's not really that helpful, because that means the other side of Denmark Straits is a very irate Norway, and possibly an irate Sweden as well. And if they've lost the ships, they're never going to be able to invade Sweden. Sorry, they're not. They've got Norway, perhaps they have a chance of invading Sweden, but if they haven't got Norway, and they've lost ships doing it, they're not able to invade Sweden. So now the Swedish iron ore is probably all going to now they can all be bought by the British. There's probably a mine barrier being placed across the North Sea to Norway and patrols going regularly backwards and forwards and a mine barrier across the channel. So now where is the German Navy going? Where are they going? What are they going to do? That's the problem for the Germans. The problem with Plan Z, the problem with all these things is, unless they get some strategic, great, uh, some blinking good luck, then they can't go anywhere. And then let's say they do get Plan Z, and let's say they do get the, the, the get those wins. Well, that's great. But if they built Plan Z by 1948, that's their plan. The Royal Navy they're going to be facing in 1948. Ooh, let's consider. What would the Royal Navy have had by 1948? The King George V. 
the lion class. Whatever has come after the lion class, because you can guarantee if the Germans are building bigger battleships than the Japanese are, the Royal Navy will be building some stonking great big battleships. Aircraft carriers. The Germans just built some aircraft carriers. Japan's building bigger aircraft carriers. Guess what the Royal Navy will probably be building? Bigger aircraft carriers. You know, the Royal Navy, which would have existed by 1948, would have been 10 years down the line it has been set on by the previous 10 years. Its destroyers would be daring class or better. The radar work it's been doing would have probably gone even further. So by the time you get to 1948, well, the German economy would be at its maximum and straining because they were already going to be straining even in 1939. They couldn't afford what they were doing. Nine, by 1948, they certainly couldn't have afforded what they are doing. But let's say they managed to scrape along. And the British economy would have been had a few more years of peace to be, uh, grow, the econ grow economically, but would also have had a few more years of peace to grow their military. You would be dealing with a completely different fleet. By 1948, there could be jet aircraft flying off British carriers. If anyone would have had them by 1948, it would have been the British. Because the British were already contemplating big jumps in aviation. You know, the forces you're dealing, you're thinking about 4C, the, the whole point about plan, uh, about plan Z, about, you know, the Z plan for the Germans, is that the British have to stand still for that plan to work. The British are not going to stand still. They're going to respond. The French aren't going to stand still. They're going to respond. The Italians aren't going to stand still. They are going to respond. You're basically starting off a naval race. And you have even weaker maritime infrastructure than you had before last time you did that. And you didn't have that strong maritime infrastructure that time. And you know how that's to be proven? Because in the run-up to World War I, Britain isn't even maxing out its yards building battle dreadnoughts. It's building dreadnoughts for other nations, it's building dreadnoughts for itself, and it's got yards which could build dreadnoughts going bankrupt because there isn't enough work. And Germany in is maxing out their yards and cannot keep up in any way, shape, or form. By World War II... It's just not going to work. So, McNair, what would you tell the Germans to build now? Um, as I've said before, what they need is a decent long-range light cruiser. Uh, that's fast and able to do the surface raiding options. Possibly some form of aircraft carrier, because I have been persuaded by Drak that an aircraft carrier would be a pretty dangerous thing for the Germans to deploy, especially if the light cruisers could escort it. And some uh, and submarines, and longer range submarines. Bigger, longer range submarines. Night down production. This is probably a foolish question, but what do you think the new SSNs look like? Uh, something like the Virginia class or something else entirely? Enjoying the stream. Sorry. I'd say my suspicion at the moment, until I'm told otherwise, is, ba is based on the American yards claiming that, and the Americans think, having to put a lot of funding into and looking into it, uh, is that the American yards are maxed out with Virginia and the new SSBN production. They are maxed out with what they're doing at the moment. And they don't, the Americans don't want to risk falling behind on orders because they want to grow the submarine fleet. They don't want it to start dropping. So the only yards which could really have some gaps and could start off doing the training, and remember the first couple at least are probably going to have to be built in either Britain or America, is Britain. In which case it's probably going to be an astute with the new reactor in. And a VLS module added in and I've already been over that in various other things but that's my gut instinct as to what we'll see especially if they're going for something quick to build off the shelf and this is quick relative in submarine terms we're probably talking about six years or so before the first one enters into service Frank's on it, Dr. C were the Dice Fire ships design, real designs from Biltrums? Yes they were they are published on the Royal Navy website 
and on Twitter. Um, guys went. Um, Rebuild Trumps and multiple uh, science fiction franchise ships. What's in it after you told the uh, uh, um, People's Liberation Army Navy probably uh, overloads their future systems? They do, and I think this in this case, the Royal Navy was just going completely um, something. The narrator. I expect they'll cr crib a lot of the astute class thanks to their low running requirement, low ma uh, low crewing requirements. Pretty much. As said. The only yard, uh, the only production line which has spare capacity is the British one at the moment because we have a, there's a, we have it designed for six, including the slip, and we currently have four. With the next one, next dreadnought due to start in 2022, but the uh, one of the A classes tended to be is supposed to be launched by that point, so we currently have two spare slots. Sonic Canera, China's just denied Journey a port visit. How is that to be seen? Um, they are being tough with the world. Arreta, I know crossing the T puts more guns on a target, but what about our ship, say, Warspite? Handle taking a broadside aimed at this bow down the long axis better than uh, taking a broadside to the flanks. Well, let's be honest. The, the idea... <clears throat> How to put it? The idea comes that if you're firing at range, you're more likely to shoot short or long. So for this way, the target's like that, so it fits. If you are shooting as a wider spread, then it's better to have broadside. So you're more likely to get a hit, but it's only going to be one hit. Whereas if you get a hit from a salvo broadside, you're probably going to get multiple hits. So that's the thing. It's crossing the T, you're more likely to get a hit. But it's going to be less hits than you would if it was a broadside. John Hargroves. There are quite a few BAE system submarines personnel gone over to Australia from years ago. I was approachable for retiring. Hmm. Next one. A thousand towns sounds reasonable. How much does normal turret weigh? A lot. Uh, we're talking about 500 or 600 tons. The you must be a blast at conferences. <laughs> uh, at conferences, I, let's see. I tend to get the panel that needs protection. Because, again, no one messes with my panel. You don't mess with my panel. And the chair. If you ask a question, which is a statement and is longer than it would take to answer, I will tell you to sit down. If you start off your question with, well, little lady, then I will tell you to sit down. And if you start off your question with, it's so interesting to see someone from your background talking about military history, I'm going to tell you to sit down. Mainly because things that don't need to be said in life. I am... I would never describe myself, and you've all listened to me probably enough to know, that I am not... My view in this long life is that everyone is an individual, treat them as such, respect them as an individual, and don't group anyone in. I hate labels, I hate grouping people to get grouping into groups, I just like to deal with the individuals and go on. That's always been my way. Respect everyone true. The moment anyone starts grouping, I don't like it. This might be because of legacy of me, because of being a dyslexic, because of my type of dyslexia, because of having dysgraphia, that I got so many labels when I was young, I hated them. 
especially when the British government came up with the idea that anyone who was it was an educational disability, instead of learning different or just dyslexia, dysgraphia, those things, you were educationally disabled. I absolutely hated that because to me, there are people who are really disabled and there are people who have real educational learning differences, which do mean they are disabled. And then there's me. You're calling me disabled. That's an insult to disabled people. I'm not. Yes, a part of my brain doesn't work, but that really doesn't affect me. So, yeah, I get, I, 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 I am the one of those, those panel chairs who's very, very, no. Um, Rapper is like, how do your colleagues view your YouTube channels, uh, activities? Some like it, some are less than keen. Menacing Rory, uh, what's the largest caliber gun type, uh, Gatling type you gun you're aware of? I think the Russians looked at a 50 millimeter, 57 millimeter Gatling, and the thousand ton figure, it was based on three barrels, and that was based on Iowa 1650s. Um. Malaga, according according to Google, Iowa weight class weighed four hundred tons more than the previous things. Take care, Tanifelaka, and um, good luck with the thunderstorm. Hope you don't get fried though. Dope Scott, when you can't see the lights of the Chinese official, it is because they are trespassing in the exclusive economic area. Mm, quite possibly. Hmm, let's add it this in. If I had 10 years to get re uh, get the German Navy ready, um, what would I have built, given how little they managed to get built? Um, I would have probably be built a decent light cruiser design. I wouldn't have built the Panzer Chief. I can understand why they built the Panzer Chief, but I wouldn't have built the Panzer Chief. You don't need eight inch gun. You you can uh, maybe an eight inch gun vessel, but probably six inch gun vessel because six inch guns are all you need to hit to take out a merchant ship uh, or an escort and carrier. I would build a carrier, especially if I had hindsight, um, or foresight, or whatever we're gonna call it. And I would build some destroyers, long-range destroyers. But honestly, my light cruisers would be my long-range escort destroyers, uh, escort vessels for my aircraft carrier. So I'd be designing my carrier and my groups, my attack groups as a carrier with three to four um, air light cruisers around them. So I'd want. I'd want four to six carriers, and I'd want 24 light cruisers. And I'd want about double that number in destroyers, and I'd want double that number again in the torpedo boat, uh, in the big torpedo boats. Um, and I'd want a whole load of Schnell boats, and I'd want U-boats, lots of them. That's what I'll be building. I, that, that's how I'd be building my force. And I'd have some of my light cruisers structured so they could be fast mine layers as well. But they would be structured so they could go to the North Atlantic. I'd specifically design them so they could operate in North Atlantic, North Sea. I'd go, Baltic's great. I want North Atlantic. Uh, Bad Guy 8829. Malaga, on the video of the US New Jersey versus the US Constitution, the main turret in New Jersey is about 2,200 tons, which is about the same weight as the US's Constitution. Hmm. Rephrase it. You and Drax seem to love battle cruisers. Any good books on the subject of specific ships? Uh, preferably one I can find without too much trouble. Brand new book review coming out this week Battle Cruiser New Zealand by Matthew Wright. Brand new. Literally just come on sale. And it's, um, it's good. 
I would say give or take in, in the foreword, but the rest of it is yeah, good. Worth reading. Tom Zen, our ends. Yeah. Jack Ayer, my wife says, you, good for you, but she said you might be missing out on some real terrible ones to tell your girlfriend, so um, she groans at you. Uh, your your thoughts on Pycreed idea, Cara dear? Well, unfortunately, no girlfriend. Um, now. Maybe, in the future. But not in that moment. And thoughts on the Pycrete air carrier idea. It's a nice idea to have a super carrier. You always want a super carrier if you can have one. And the Pycrete carrier would have been very, very big. Honestly, the interesting problem that comes with the Pycrete carrier is it's so big, not just controlling it, but commanding it, steering it. It's definitely going to be a replenishment at sea, but it's going to be the sort of replenishment at sea where the other ship docks with you. I'm just actually having a mental image. I'm fairly sure if Bismarck came across a Pie Creek carrier as fully designed as Habakkuk, uh, what would have happened would be more case of not fighting her so much as ramming, pointing in the direction of Bismarck, and Bismarck going... I am firing all my guns and it is having no effect. <laughs> this ship has so much mass, it is having no effect. <laughs> and eventually the Bismarck just goes, I'm just going to have to keep away. And just airstrikes the whole time coming in on Bismarck. It would not be good. But uh, yeah, Matthew writes New Zealand. Good book on Battle Cruisers. Um... The French decide that this whole Breda variant is a bit silly if it's so secret they can't tell the Dutch. There are so many things that are so secret they can't tell the Dutch. Uh, Jengenev, uh, would it have worked if their air gap wasn't about to be closed so quickly, comparatively, say, if the war kicked off earlier? Um, able to be closed so quickly? No, it wouldn't, because the Germans would have had even, uh, even less... Uh, Gary Cron. Then the Germans just keep get, uh, just keep Belgium and waiting for another few years, just like the 1938 annexation of Czechoslovakia. Um, honestly, if there's a if it's down to a sort of stalemate grudge match of World War One, they probably don't keep Belgium because, in the nicest way, do the French? They're probably partially in French territory, and the British will probably keep fighting, and that means Germany's fighting a war and not getting anything for it. Uh, British command, what do you mean we've lost an armored division in the Ardennes forest? That let's be honest, there are a couple of divisional generals who could have lost an entire armored division to the in the Ardennes forest. Hello, Frank Swallow. Thank you. Thank you, narrator. Frank Swallow. Germany somehow builds the H-44. What does the RM build? If Germany builds the H-44, then someone probably dregs out the design for the incomparable and updates it. Let's see, the H-44. <sighs> so, um... 44, 44. Main battery, 20 inch guns. Yeah. I'm fairly sure someone either dregs out the incomparable and updates it, or alternatively, the RN might just go. Mm. 
You see, the other option the British go for is the Germans have gone for eight 20 inch guns, which are going to be quite slow firing. The British might use their knowledge of quad turrets and go for 16 16 inch guns. So you might see a sort of super lion with 16 16 inch guns. And that would not be pretty. And the reason I say that is because the British can either dredge out their 18 inch gun, which they might do from Argent Corps days, they might dredge out the designs of Incomparable, or they've already got 16 inch guns, which they know how they work and they can work them together. They've got a quadruple turret, which they've got working for 14 inch. Scaling up 14 for 16 inch is not that difficult. Scaling up. Uh, working out and building a new treble 18 inch or all those things are going to take time. It's far quicker probably to build a quadruple 16 inch turret. So that's probably the British response. In which case I would not like to be the Germans because if you've got 16 16 inch guns on a battleship aiming for you and you've only got eight 20 inch guns, you're gonna say, well, you know, I've got the 20 inch guns, I should win this. But they've got twice your broadside, which means twice the chance of getting hits. And they're gonna have a faster rate of fire. So they're probably going to fire, honestly, considering the German loading and reloading practices, probably they're gonna try to fire three times for your twice. So they're going to have 48 shells in the air in uh, for your 16. That means three times as many shells in the air. And that means getting more accurate more quickly. Uh, that's not nice. That is not, not nice. Shumak. Probably the biggest problem with the deal of 1948 war plan is that Black Swan is at this point an old loader capability escort. Yes, but imagine what the conversion of the Black Swan, uh, what sloop the Royal Navy are building by 1948. And in nicest way, they'd also started the flag. The, the thing is, you have to remember that in 1939, they start building the flower class corvette anyway. So the British have been building a lot of escorts. That's your big problem. The fact that the British have started the construction of the flower class, they've sort of gone through the de development design and already started construction of the flower class in 1939. That's going to be a base model, and your black swans are going to be a base model in 1939. They will only be improving those as the years go on, especially as the treaties lapse. Um, by 1948, the Brits will be busy dealing with independent India. Well, to be fair, independent India may or may not have happened by 1948 if there hadn't been World War II. It might have still happened under that thing, but it probably happened in different progress. And either way, it probably wouldn't have affected the British in terms of uh, their ability to wage war. Or their ability to, their reasons to fight the American, uh, fight the uh, the Germans. So they'd have still been focused. They are plenty focused. Hmm. Um. Uh, the Ardennes, the Luftwaffe made combat suites and recon in front of their attack. They did in the Ardennes. But you never know. They still might have come across, or they might not have, might have missed an armor division. We are trying to come up with a reason for them not to succeed in the Ardennes forest. Missing a British armor division, having been somehow got lost and being there when it's not supposed to. Um, uh, Frank Spider, I saw there was another RN Force C in the Mediterranean later in the war. What may you know about this? It, I think I actually discussed it in the Force K, one of my Force K videos.
So, no, no, what yards did go bankrupt because they didn't build enough uh, yard, uh, dreadnoughts? I think one of the bar, uh, yards called J Johnson in Glasgow went yeah, bankrupt, and I think a couple of others did. Uh, I can't remember the, quite the names, but I've got a list of them. There's one on the Tyne. Tyne. There's uh, one, I think one of the ones in Southampton does as well, which used to build warships. Um, I'm curious, I... The Franks one did Belfast go bankrupt? Mm, not that quickly. I think the war itself and how Britain went to war was a central gr grievance that incited the Quit India movement. Might have pushed it down the road a bit. Mm. The Clon 95. Should cruisers make a comeback in modern day? Uh, you can name them after the air refusers. Ooh, that'd be good. Atrap, do you think the Aussie SSN will go for the angular anti active sonar look or just a standard round tube, especially given the confined nature of the South China Sea? I have a feeling there'll be something based on the astute. So, as I have a feeling, they will be as off the shelf as possible to car and get them into service as quickly as possible. Very sorry. Let me see, I just realized that you and Drak remind me of the brothers from Fraser. Just as long as I'm not Nile, I don't mind. Um, that's good. Read dyslexia. A part of your brain works differently than the educational system is set up to deal with. Pretty much. Uh, Vinny kids. I had issues as well with the public school system and dyslexia. Well, uh, basically the public school system. The reason I have this accent I do and sound like as posh as I do is because the state schools uh, want to put me into a special needs school, which had very much uh, had strict limitations on what you could do academically. And my mum didn't like that. My mum said, well, no, he's quite capable. And, and there was an issue. And um, anyway, I ended up doing, my mum turned around to me and said, you're doing the scholarship into the local private school. I went, yes, mum, because I was a good son. And I got the scholarship. <laughs> so I went to private school. And if you want a real education life, be a scholarship for a student at a private school. It's great fun. There is a reason I know how so many ways to give people friendly handshakes. Shomak, sure, if I was part of the German Navy going into World War II, I would slap <laughs> people with a 5 inch 38 until they get the picture and decide that they, we will use dual purpose guns. I was thinking something on the lines of the 4.5 inch, but yeah, we'll do it go to 5 inch. Either way works. Uh, Michelle Hines, have you seen the Memory of Justice interview with Indu Donton? It's your thoughts? Is there any way possible he did not know that Sailor was being used to build you boats? I find it hard to believe. I find it physically impossible to believe. Absolutely physically impossible to believe he didn't know. Um... I really don't understand how he gets away with this. Um, he does, he manages it, but either he is incredibly unable to actually... I don't know do his job and pay attention, or he is so obsessively controlling over his submarine fleet, and considering he is so obsessively controlling over his submarine fleet, you think he'd be very, very obsessive and controlling over how they're being built. Yeah. You, you, that he, he doesn't know. He's so obsessed with operations, he doesn't know how ships are being built. He's obsessed with his trips. He's obsessed with the U-boats. He micromanages from the nth degree. Someone like that is going to know what how they're being built. If he doesn't, it's dereliction of duty. <laughs> Darius Shradowski. Yeah, I'm dyslexic, and I uh, detest such labelling of people with learning problems. They need uh, they need non standard education as disabled. Yes, it's it, it it undermines. I think actually people who I'm not even keen sometimes on some of the things where they do bring in the the first uh, the phrase disabled. I have a couple of friends who are, thanks, let's say, to Afghanistan and Iraq, are categorized disabled that way now, and they don't even like the label then. 
they, you need some benefits, and the, that's why you have the phraseology, and it helps that because it gets some benefits for them, which they do need to make their lives easier. But it's you know, uh, Shimmy Bismarck, is this how the Titanic felt? Potentially. <laughs> Hello, Oswiski. 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 Oh, Oswiski. Oh, <sighs> Paul Beswick, my worry about the Habakkuk design was the warping of the flight deck after all the ice. Oh. All ice of that size is not rigid. It would have been interesting, but there again also, the flight deck would have been quite so massive, it would have basically been a lumpy, bumpy airfield, which they have got to take off grass anyway. Oswalski, uh, do you prefer to use the metric system or the British old units? And why do you prefer one system or the other? Uh, what are your thoughts about both systems? I honestly can use both systems, because I'm used to working with scientists and engineers at work who use the metric system. And I'm used to working with the older members of my family who use the Imperial, and I can do the, the I can do the conversions in my head. So I honestly, I have to say, metric tends to be easier. It does tend to be easier. And when I find myself thinking about an inch, I do describe it as two point five four millimeters. But yeah. I don't mind if that's what, uh, you know, look. It's one of those symbolist things, and it's also one of those things which I think is a trap for the opposition. It's kind of like the phrase levelling up. It's a trap. If you start campaigning against it, or you start, you automatically annoy more people than you get to your side. Because most people either don't care or just think it's nice to have it back because it's the measurements they grew up with, so they really don't mind. They can do both, and it's nice being able to do both, and they don't see the problem in it. It doesn't really... It, for most people, it doesn't compute as an issue. It's a case of, if it's there, fine. If it's not there, we don't mind. But the moment you start saying, it's wrong, it shouldn't be there, they sort of look at you and go, why? What do you have against it? What's your problem? It's a good way of making your opposition sound like they are disconnected from the public. Because you set it up and you hope one of them, or in this case, entire parties of them, are silly enough to fall for it. Sean Quigley, is it possible that China is using its fishing fleet not just to feed the population, but in fact strategically weaken economies and make it easier to cut deals with those countries in the future? Never bet against the Chinese thinking free moves ahead. I don't know if they are or they aren't, but I wouldn't bet against them thinking free moves ahead, because remember, most Western democracies, and this is the problem of both the benefit and the fault of democracies, is that most politicians only think as far as the next election. The thing about Xi Jinping and his people around him is they're not thinking about the next election because there isn't going to be one. They're thinking about long... This is the, one of the things of the Chinese system which you can say works their advantage. They think longer term because they're in power for longer term i.e. they will still be there in 20 years, so they can afford to make a 20-year plan. Most politicians in Western countries make a four-year plan. Um, Frank Spider, so the RN used the older German idea of smaller, faster firing guns than the Germans go up. Uh, to be fair, the British have been doing that idea for a while. I think that's been an idea for a while for having faster firing guns. And that's one of the reasons why the British go for the 14-inch. I have a feeling the British thought they could get a 14-inch autoloader working, which is another reason why they were pushing for it, and it didn't work. It, just, it would explain why King George V's um, turrets take, uh, design takes so long to confirm and uh, go down on, and, you know, solidify on.
Baron Sorelsen, Habakkuk is so big that it can mount 14-inch cannons for defense and it wouldn't be a problem. Frank Spanner, what's the name Black Swan on purpose? Yes. Tarmac, that is my point. The Black Swan, the Sterling ASW, pro, uh, uh, the ASW platform, is old and kind of bad at this point. Honestly, it would still be a fairly decent only submarine warfare platform. Let's be honest, 10 years submarine development. Submarines have probably got faster, but again, for protecting a convoy, a, 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 a Black Swan's going to be fine. It's still going to be a fairly good vessel, and it'll probably be an upgraded with uh well probably whatever super squid or hedgehog they developed in that period so yes but it'll probably be upgraded and that's the point about the black swans really their big advantage during world war ii was the how quickly they could be upgraded the black swans which enter in 1939 are very different to the black swans which finished the war in 1945-46 so yes they would have they would have been different uh, Senator Canary, what if Germany never starts World War II? We have peaceful lives and we have a whole stream of history. Books don't get written. Um, Frank Spider, two hours, 47 minutes. Yeah, cool. I'm only 13 minutes behind. Or 14 minutes behind. Uh, come on, 316 inch radar for far. Do I get it that when battleships bracketed the target, they switched to rapid fire mode as long as they kept hitting the bracketing? Pretty much. Frank Spano, IJ and Invaders the Philippines in 1946. Potentially. That is the other point. You have to remember, World War II, as I often... I, 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 my favourite thing for scaring people when they start to, to start to say that Britain should have been preparing for fighting a war with Germany and why weren't they focusing on this, 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 as I go, well, in 1939, 1938 and 1940, there are more incidents with the British Royal Navy pointing guns at the Japanese Navy than at everyone else in the world combined in any of those years. In which case, who does Britain think it's the most likely to end up at war with first? Germany, who are being re uh, who are bellicose and rhetoric, but they think they have control of through diplomacy. Or Japan, which is ignoring the global diplomatic system and keeps pointing guns at them. Um, Yeah. That's the other interesting thing. What happens if World War II starts with Japan first? And there is an Anglo-American alliance fighting the Japanese in 1939. Does Germany declare war at that point? Or do they decide that, frankly, going to war with America and Britain might not be a good idea? Because if America and Britain are already fighting a war alongside each other in the Far East, probably with, uh, probably with France as a member, and the Dutch, that means there's already a four-way alliance going. And that means there's already a lot of supplies being organized and they're already on a war footing. And you then attack them by stabbing them in the back. Oh my lord, you're dealing with the British Empire, America, France, and the Dutch all combined. Yeah, no, that's not a good idea. That's not good. That would not be good for you. That'd be a very big problem for your health. Yes. Selecting that. Bam, bam. I like to try and make a um, divide it up into sections as I go, because otherwise I always forget to go back until later in the week, and then I feel people have been robbed in a way. Uh, Japanese could not have waited till 1948, so Germany would be fighting alone, possibly Italy. Um, yeah, that's if Mussolini's still in charge of Italy by 1948. Remember, Mussolini's control of Italy is always weaker than um, Hitler's control of Germany, mainly because there is a gentleman called King Victor Emmanuel. John Quigley. 
Oluski, by destroying the fish stocks, they force the country to support both the fishermen with no jobs and also find or import food stocks that they otherwise could have supplied themselves. Hmm. Also, the taxes they could have collected from those fallen fishermen is gone. And the shipyards and all the other things that they supported. Yikers, I had a similar situation. My parents were in a position to pay for private school. Hmm. It helps. But I think I, I didn't get a full scholarship. I got a most scholarship. A mostly scholarship. I think I got a 50 or something percent scholarship. I seem to remember. I'm not sure. Uh, my mum has all the details. And luckily my granddad basically paid the rest. Because it was during the time when my dad was out of work as a naval architect. That was the interesting thing growing up. My dad would I'd be having very well paid work. Or he'd be out of work because of the way the shipbuilding industry was at the time. It's really quite funny. After we got older and uh, he got a lot more work as he got older. I'm now trying to imagine Dr. C as one of those stereotypical British punks. Mohawks and nose rings. Not my style. My style was rugby prop forward and trombone player in the big band. And shooting club occasionally. And swimming club. And a few other things. Duckland 95, what do you think a modern uh, milk cow sub would look like? Like, that would be an impressive thing to see. Could be used as a blockade runner, should kind of hit the small Aussie islands. Um... Honestly, we're starting to look at reproducing them. So in fact, I'm, uh, uh, I've been looking at it and thinking, I wonder if we're going to get back to this idea. Because at a certain point, you're going to have to start putting a hanger in your submarines for uncrewed vehicles to go out and deploy out of them and deploy in. To be reconfigured or repaired, or you know, all the other scenarios that could be done, because that's what we're sort of reaching the point of. And once you have a hangar, you then have a space which you can use for transporting supplies as well. We already have similar spaces like that built into ships for special forces. If you consider there are astute class submarines, it's usually at least one astute wandering around the world for the Royal Navy, and the Americans have very similar, which has a cylinder. Outside the conning, uh, uh, just uh, from, uh, connecting into the conning tower, into the um, sail, and going back and just perched on top of the hull. And that is for deploying and recovering special forces and their equipment. That's an attachment on the outside. As it becomes more important, I see that being built into the sub because, frankly, it needs to be. That creates noise sitting out there like that. Yes, you can make it as smooth as you like, but it's still going to make noise. More noise than a normal hull does. And more noise than you want it to. So at a certain point, you're going to have to think this through and start going, hmm. And that would be interesting. When you have those, if you have them on the top, you, know, you might have them different points in the sub. It all depends on how they develop. This is why I also think that we need to, it would be good for Britain to have a batch free astutes and then go the SNS, SSNR program to first develop the reactor, the VLS module and those sort of things, put them in before you start going down this route because they give this time, more time to sort of mature and work out what you're going to need. Done it clear. If warships now get 3D printers, you just know there'll be an underground wargaming scene on each ship. You think there already isn't? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every ship I've been on. There is no way he... Uh, Sean Mac, I presume this is due to Donuts. There is no way he could not know because the work quality on the subs... Because they were there, and he followed up and didn't. Well, yes, I mean, so honestly, I don't know how they did. They believed he didn't. It's 
Senator, what do you think about pre-decimal money in Britain? Please don't bring it back. Uh, uh, my mum has explained it to me many times, and uh, uh, trust me, there are some places you can go in the UK where you still find the old amounts put up there. And you have to work out what the current pence is, uh, works to convert to it. Ooh, hello. All right, let's see. What am I catching up with? Oswitzki, uh, like with size of TV screens, they're inches. But most people don't don't treat inches they, uh, there as units of measurements. More like a name of size. That 32 is much more than that 40-inch daily thing. Hello, furry kitten. I have never used cups in cooking, except when following a US or Australian recipe. Most British recipes, or recipes use mass, utilize mass for flour, sugar, right? And you can get fluid out spoons or 25 mil spoons. Yeah. Yeah, yes. um, Dr. Clark, as a child, I grew up reading the World War II history books by time. Uh, by time, you have you read them? Um, thoughts on their accuracy? Mm, they're as accurate as books of that period can be. Also, what do you think of a modern US cruiser besides VLS? Decent guns, radar, and command facilities. Basically, someone please take a Zumwalt class, extend it a little bit. Add in more VLS and take out one of the main guns, turn the other one to an advanced gun system, and just stick in the hypersonic launchers. And other than that, just leave it be, and it probably do. Maybe add in the latest ages, a latest uh, radar system and command system from the um, Burks, but make sure you have plenty of command spaces and space in the command CIC because what you need is a command ship, and that's what the cruisers fulfill the role of. I'll ask you, once you start to converting gun calibers to Imperial, something all strange things like 114mm, 127mm, 152mm, yeah, it does get fun. It's good to know both. Jack Ray, I like it when the math is the same, like miles per gallon, than of us kilometers per litre. The litres per 100 kilometer all annoys me. Also, I'm used to inches and metal but centimeters I don't like. Maybe I'm a bit odd. Eh, yeah, we can all be a bit odd. That's the thing about it. once you're an adult, you can be odd. It doesn't matter. In fact, even when you're a kid, be odd. Be yourself. Who cares? If you spend your whole life worrying what other people think of you, you never get to be you. You get to be what other people think you think other people want you to be. And that's no fun at all. You know, I'm a naval history geek and I love it. I love doing naval history stuff. I love doing, I love teaching history of engineering. I love teaching history. I love doing all that stuff. I love writing books. I love going and doing the research. I love reading books. I love all the stuff I get to do on a YouTube channel. That is not normal. I have loved doing this all my life. That is not normal. Not everyone wants to do that. Who cares? It's what I enjoy. Admittedly, don't take books like this with you to the gym. Okay? I, I, I will say that for two reasons. One, you scare the weightlifters. Two, and you do, trust me. You want to freak people out when they're weightlifting. Uh, you do bench pressing while having a book. Uh, you'll do leg presses while reading a book. If you want to freak them out. <laughs> leg press, roughly 250 kilograms. Um, 250, 270 kilograms. Uh, while reading a book. Not panting, not grunting, not making any funny noises, just sitting there calmly reading a book. You will freak all the weightlifters out. They will go out of their brain. It's fun. But don't do it. I, I can get away with it because I'm a fairly big bloke and no one tends to cause me much trouble. Were there any RM battleships or battlecruisers on the Pacific in 1942 or 43? Uh, there were a lot in the Indian Ocean. Mm, not really any in 42, 43. They would have been there if they needed them. Honestly, they did offer renown. At a couple of points, they offer renown. And it would have been interesting. It was almost renown and victorious going together. And that would have been an interesting little battle group to send together. 
it would also meant Renown would have probably got an upgrade. Which would have been very, very cool. If if the if the battle if you know Renown had gone out as Victorious as escort, and then you might have ended up with Renown, Victorious, and Sarakatoga doing the com doing the operations together, because honestly, those three ships could have kept up with each other, and that would have added a whole new dimension to the operations with the versus the Japanese. Because let's be honest, if you've got a fifteen inch upgraded Renown with you. You're going to be less worried about maybe a Congo catching your carrier group or a cruiser catching a carrier group because, oh yeah, hello, Japanese cruiser. Hello, my name is HMS Renown. While you're getting air attacked, please note, you get within range of my 15-inch guns. I've got six of them. You might have 18-inch, eight inch, eight inch, but I have the latest radars and I have six 6 15-inch guns. It would have been an interesting time to have been alive and to watch. And um, Nightmare Productions, forgive me a little off topic, but you have at least two Malters and Hermes in the Falklands campaign. Both Malters are squadrons of Bucks and Phantoms. Did a Black Buck mission still happen? I imagine the Bucks would do the job. I told them Vulcans vol, but what force were, uh, what were, were that force would they be needed? Uh, the Vulcans would probably be used to threaten, maybe even suppress Argentinian air bases on their shore. The nicest way they wouldn't be involved in the strikes on land because you'd be using the phantoms, especially if you've got Hermes and Malta. Uh, you'd probably be using Hermes as a commando carrier. Hermes would probably be carrying the commando helicopters and maybe some uh, maybe some Harriers even, uh, which would, might be the RAF involvement because the Harri uh, RAF might still have had Harriers. Would probably still have had Harriers. And might even mean some navy harriers to support the commando carry effort or whatever. But that Hermes would probably have been sitting in San Carlos Bay or not far off San Carlos Bay because well they might have gone through Penguin Penguin Bay instead if he'd had a full LPH, which I know Andrew, uh, which I know Michael Clapp did consider because he thought he could better support that. But probably supposed to be gone to San Carlos. And the Maltas, well, you'd have probably had a two-carrier task force position themselves slightly to the north east of the islands, slightly to the northeast of the islands, but with AWACS up sitting to the west of the islands and over the islands, and probably some more AWACS out over to the north of the, t of the carriers. To provide them with distance, and you'd have had caps of phantoms sitting up there going, Come to us, come to us. Uh, it wouldn't have been nice for the Argentines. It would, especially as by that point, we'd have probably ended up going E2C. We'd have probably had the E2C Hawkeye. Because we needed to replace the fairy gannets, and it's either we upgrade them, or upgrade them, or we go in on the Hawkeye program. If we got the Maltas, we'd probably go on the Hawkeye program. And we probably have. Again, if you have the Malters, you're probably talking about two squadrons of Phantoms and two squadrons of Buccaneers per, per, per carrier, at least. So you're probably talking 24 of each, plus anti submarine helicopters and AWACS aircraft. So you're probably talking roughly 72 aircraft. That's not good for the, you know. You've got 48 Phantoms. Maintaining an air patrol of 8 becomes easy. Maintaining a cap of, a constant cap of 12 becomes very viable. Maintaining a cap of 12 and a deck alert of 8 becomes very good. You might even have, you might even during daylight hours uh, surge to sixteen, and then at night have just eight as cap. But you probably would maintain a twenty-four hour cap with phantoms. In which case, you'd be intercepting things like the supply aircraft. It would not be a good scenario for the Argentines, as you'd have also have forty-eight buccaneers basically night and day 
touring round the Argentine positions and blowing them up. There might not even be a need to destroy the airfield because nothing's going to get through those but uh, those phantoms. So you might as well leave the airfield intact so you can use it after you take it back. Ducklin, were, were there uh, ever any super soldier programs in World War Two? I know the Finns used to dr uh, drug their soldiers during World War War, um, and fetamines, all sorts of things, were given to troops in World War Two. It wasn't particularly um, nice. Uh -huh. Adverb, how much does fighting small wars help prevent large ones? E.g., show how to practice the Russian Syriac. Um, it depends. At what point does the small war cost uh, wear your forces down so much? By the balance in Afghanistan and Iraq, because they are technically considered small wars. Calvin Gersberg, uh, trombone playing ACDC rings that we uh, play with ACDC ringtone. I also play the bass guitar and the drums. Not very well. Just as usual on the drums, but I do. I do see for a modern milk clout, do you look like a, a, a container ship on top, but give the dock on the uh, key, uh, dock on the other side of the sub to enter without undue attention? Potentially, uh, container ship or something like out of the uh, Bond movie. Yeah, possibly. Nighttime Productions. On the hypothetical milk cow submarine, uh, have you seen USS Halibut, an uh, old Regulus boat converted by John P. Crone for special ops work? Was Rosnoff locating the Soviet Gulf uh, SSB that Glomar Explorer, Explorer um, uh, partially recovered? It had a remote camera sled uh, called the Fish, based out of the then surplus missile compartment. Hmm. Cool. I suffered. Uh, Frank Swatter, three hours, fifteen minutes. Oh, I'm seven hours, I'm seven minutes behind. Oswalski, uh, should the Polish Navy buy convert corvettes or frigates? The Polish Navy is planning to buy some frigates, considering that the Polish Navy operates prime in Baltic Sea. Which option is better? Um, depends. Are they calling them frigates because that sounds better in NATO terms and they're actually buying corvettes? See what they build. If then possibly they're buying frigates because they need to have an expeditionary capability. It might well be that they know that any large surface ships in the Baltic are not particularly that massively useful. So what do they have frigates for? Are frigates for fighting on the Baltic? Or are the frigates for, I don't know, operating in North Atlantic? Or operating maybe even as far away as in the Pacific to support American and other ally America and other allies in other theatres? To support, uh, to come and help them over here, back in Poland. Sometimes you build a small token force that you can send elsewhere to assist, so that you remind your major allies that you are very useful to them and you are keen to help them where you can. It's the joy of the burden sharing language. Before World War One, Rosyth was the main North base. They moved to Orkney as the war was about to start, but parts of the Grand Fleet still were operating from the Rosyth at times. Yes, it was where they could get the most trains. Calm, Dr. Clark, I'm ashamed you're not with Drac live from Tankfest. As I said earlier, I did consider it, but there are issues. I, I, you know, I've done all I have done to try and protect my family. I'm not going to risk it now at this moment. Decision. Night actions in Iron Bottom Sound get very interesting if Aaron Iran is playing with Aaron Night Tactics. Very interesting, especially if she has radar. Uh, Doctor ninety five. I'm thinking I four hundred style, but with modern day design. Uh, they USV or mini subs or cylinders with food, water, fuel to keep us running. Interesting. An idea. Kenneth Johnson, is there much about operations in the ocean against uh, working with Germany and Navy against? Uh, right now. 
upside down. <laughs> Drop one down. Not that one. Where is the Eastern Fleet? It's Boyd's Eastern Fleet. Uh, one book. Which I have somewhere around here staring at me, I'm fairly certain. Because I was reading it just yesterday. Where have I put you down? Boyd. Not those ones. Good lord, I've built that up. That's become quite a big pile, hasn't it? How am I in chance to tuck a lot of things into you? Possibly. Let's check that pile. No. Nope. Sorry about this. Let's see. Did I take it away with me? That's some of all. I took that away with me. Ooh, that was fun. I guess. That's a good read. I think we already discussed that one. Ooh, Liam, hello. You're back. Churchill's Admiral, that was the one with the Spanish Civil War, good one. Hang on. Need you, need you there, because I haven't done you yet, have I? I've done Total Journey there. I haven't done that. And I've done Tiger from Pots. Sorry about this. Uh, Jutland Scandal. Battle in the Breeze. Oh, I haven't done that one yet, have I? I haven't done that one. That's the Norman Freeman submarine book, which is really, really good. I'm not sure I've done that review yet, but I should have done. And from what piece, I've definitely done that one. I think I have done that book. I think I have. Okay. Ah, sorry, I haven't unpacked the last of my boxes from going away. This is a historian who travels. What do you take your books in? And, yeah, there you go. There's Boyd. I knew it was somewhere around there. American Civil War by John Keegan. It's a fairly good read. World War II from Above by Major General Julian Thompson. Victory in Europe, remember, by Julian Thompson. Battleships. Lots of books by Julian Thompson. It must be a pen. Oh, there you go. Andrew Boyd's The Royal Navy Fleet in Eastern Waters, Linchpin and Victory, 1935 to 1942. That is the book you want. Uh, Kenrick Johnson. There you go. Oh, that one. Who knows, they might invite me to write an edition of Don't you fall over. I do need to get the final stage of this office completed. At some point, I am probably going to have to record a load of videos and say, I'm not doing lives for two weeks while I'm getting all my office built to standard. And finally get the... Um, Various shelves in there and the art, the, the iron brew bottles lit up there. So I have all that shelving and that shelving in place. And I can sort everything out. But it's actually getting the uh, few minutes to, uh, to hunt down. Ah, the Hetza, a Jeg Panther. Like a 38 tank destroyer. Where did I pick that book up? Or did it get sent to me to review? Probably got sent to me to review. Ooh, RAF Operations Manual, Battle of Britain. Always worth, uh, always worth an interesting read. I uh, only got it for seven quid, so it's worthwhile getting. Uh, Julian Thompson, Behind Enemy Lines, and Gunbite Diplomacy by James Cable. Before anyone asks, I have another two boxes to unload for my travels. No, I was not going a million miles away, but I was travelling and I was doing research while I was travelling. So, lots of books.
Um, Ozowski, funny if HMS Renown gets a long lance during the night action and makes bye bye for the surface of the sea. Renown actually could probably do okay against a single long lance. She'd probably be okay. Because she has quite good um, protections. Especially if she's been upgraded. But guys, were there any serious plans for US Battle Cruiser before Lexington? Not really. Um, project planning and thinking, um, Oswalski, is a nice way of saying prevaricating for decades. Thinking if they need, do they need one? Shumak, two questions. My impression is that the sinking, uh, sidelining of the Iron Pacific had more to do with the USN budget battles than anything else. Your thoughts on the USN on RN gun, uh, your thoughts on USN on RN gun caliber. USN and RN gun caliber is what they've chosen at the time. It's basically developing what they have available. Both could probably cover each other for different reasons. As for the budget battles, well, in a night, in, in, in to an extent, considering their infrastructure and their various capabilities, the RNs lodged its major infrastructure hub in the Far East, which was Singapore, and is operating out of Ceylon and operating at a Trim Comley in Ceylon, or Sri Lanka, and um, Australia, which they're having to build up. And the Americans are, to an extent, depending upon British infrastructure in Australia, i.e. the fuel stocks we've built up there in the interwar period. But the British are also fighting in the Mediterranean and are fighting in the North Atlantic. So either the Americans need to provide extra support in the North Atlantic, or the British have to deal with the North Atlantic and basically... Uh, the the idea is the Royal Navy takes the lead in the war, the fight versus Germany and the fight versus Italy. And America takes the lead in the war versus Japan until either one or the other is defeated and then the other goes and joins them. It's annoying, but it's sensible. Mm hmm. Sure, Mike. Escalate. Uh, ah, you have thoughts on the US on the USNR and gun caliber escalations, pre World War One and World War Two. One, well, pre World One, World One. Which is better, two inch jumps or one and a half inches? I prefer two inch jumps, but that's because I like to have the bigger guns. And honestly, I think we should have gone to fourteen rather than thirteen and a half. I know logistically and various other reasons it makes it's far easier to jump the one and a half, but. I think if we jump to 14, then the Queen Elizabeth's are 16-inch guns, and I think at which point the the Germans are in real, real trouble. And also, then there's no argument of people going, well, you know, the German 12-inch was as good as the British 13.5-inch. Really? It was good as the 14-inch? Really? Anyone going to try and claim that? No. Wasn't. Calm Gazard, uh, Afik, uh, RG aircraft had already pushed their range limit with high-low mission profile. With just AWACS uh, or F4 cap, the low part is as long as their range is just too short. Um, yeah, it would be really, really painful for them to fight that. But guys, here tuning. Would the RN risk a fast battleship and or battlecruiser in the Guadalcanal Canal like the US, and, uh, US did, and how would they do in a night engagement close battle? Both range. The RN had fairly good close quarters and night battle tactics. They would probably risk them. Because let's be honest, they risk them in the Mediterranean. They risk them all over the world. The RN risk, the, uh, risk their battleships on quite a regular basis. Um, Frank Spasato, serious question about the sex here. Does the same thing happen to you when trying to read musical notes? <sighs> to an extent, but what I used to do was I used to, especially with the trombone, I used to practice until it was muscle memory. Especially difficult bits. Paul Beswick, if there were two mortars operating in Falklands War, Buccaneers could well have taken uh, taken Belgrano and Argentine carrier. Would have been slimmer pickings for the SSNs. Oh yes, it would have been. Sure, Mac. Uh, would possibly it depends on who's command. If Vien is in charge, he'll probably display orders to enter night action to try to just see, to seize the Japanese battleship as a prize. I'm not sure. If the Royal Navy sends both a battleship a battle cruiser I renown and victorious to the Far East. Uh, to the Pacific, then the odds are a rear admiral does go. And interestingly enough, Vian could have been the perfect rear admiral for that, considering what he was used. So he might have ended up not in the Mediterranean, he might have ended up in the Far East earlier, which would have been interesting if he'd been in the Far East. He is certainly the rear admiral, one of the rear admirals they like to send around for various distributed operations, let's say. Um... Come, same but off to Tiger Day in April. Ooh, I might try and get the bit like that. 
Adverb, does the AUKUS agreement change just sending some roaming river class versus something larger out of Australia? Uh, I think it builds up to what's going to be operating in the Far East. I have a feeling the British are going to build up to a permanent presence of a couple of river class, a Type 31, uh, maybe two Type 31s, and probably an SSN permanently being out there. Frank Spanner, I have literally seen many books refer to ground fleet at anchor in Scarborough Flow while having that bridge in the background. I know, but there are people who don't know how to label pictures properly. Time goes, but a rebuilt Baltic fleet, a floating sand battery or two, I ages for good, might come handy as land based ones might have a large Inglington magnet to say so. Potentially. Um, Bud Guy, is there a date when the Australians hope to start construction of new SSNs? Uh, they have a date. A flowchart has been produced, in fact. Um, whether they actually achieve or not, who knows? Oh, I'm only six minutes per hard, according to Frank Spillard, I don't know. Um... Malaga, are you able to fit your books in a car? Do you travel by van? I travel by car. I have a very nice, lovely um, Subaru Impreza wagon. In fact, if anyone's ever seen the Africa Challenge, where Richard Hammond is driving a Subaru from the old Top Gear, that's what I drive. That's my. That's the same as my car. Although my car looks a lot dirtier, I remember, because it's parked beneath trees, which there are birds pooing out of the whole time. Bug guy eight six two nine. Did the RN ever try the US heavy sixteen inch shells and Nelsons? I don't think so, but I think they would have been tempted if they'd had the chance. Sarah Gordon, that's right. Do you know of any good fiction writers producing World War One, World War Two era novels today? And uh, if you have read H. Mercedes Ulysses, what would you the character you be? I am um, cannot remember Ulysses enough to remember which characters I'd be. And I have actually done a whole. Book a uh, whole video about fiction books from World War Two, so I would recommend going to that because at the moment, off the top of my head, I can't remember any, but there are some good ones. I think Regan is the name which keeps flushing in my head, but I think it's probably wrong. I know there's one about um a the third renowned sister, and I would always love a third renowned sister. I think it should have been three renowns. Oswalski, how much the German Navy won the Second World War was worse because they stuck they stuck for small gun, such small guns? Let's put it this way, they really weren't good at the general pur they didn't have good general purpose weapons. They needed good general purpose weapons and they just didn't have them. They just didn't have them. And that's a problem. That is a big problem for them. There we go. I don't know. I don't know. I will have to sort that all out in another second. Now let's see what's the next book. Next question. I have the next question picked up as a thing. Um. Oh yes. Let's do that border for the Seneca Nero. That can be my next time st timestamp. At the end of uh, fascistly joins the Allies instead of joining the war the exercise. What happens on the naval side of the war? Ooh. Well, that's a very interesting thing. That is a very interesting thing. What happens? Well, if you don't have Italy, if you have Italy in the war on the side of the British and the Allies, so they support the French. A, the French might not sue for peace. They might keep fighting, especially if they have Italy coming in and maybe attacking Austria or attacking the southern part of Germany. Uh, instead of doing the, uh, doing the whole Greece and Dodecanese campaign, the Italians might do that. Uh, B, the Mediterranean suddenly becomes a very much an allied sea, an allied lake. No, no problem there. Suddenly you have 
No trouble moving convoys or anything through the Mediterranean to go to the Far East or come to the UK. You have the Italian fleet to back you up versus German Navy. Uh, it, it just changes things dram dramatically. Because, let's put it this way, if the British want to... Uh, oh, would an Italian squadron fair, like to come and visit Recife? And sit in Scarpa Flow for a bit of the war uh, to help with deterring German uh, surface raiders. And that, of course, would free up some British battleships to go to the Far East to deter Japan. It just it changes the character of war. Think of that. Aircraft carriers in the, in the Mediterranean that wouldn't get damaged. Probably Ark Royal wouldn't get hurt. Illustrious wouldn't get hurt. Lots of aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean just wouldn't get hurt. Lots of battleships in the Mediterranean wouldn't get hurt. Valiant, not damaged. So probably not in that dry dock. Queen Elizabeth, not damaged. You know, the differences on World War II would be immense with Italy not being on the side of the Axis forces. Uh, Frank Smart. Dr. C, if the IJN had kept the USN back in the Pacific for longer in the war, say, don't go into Saipan until the end of 44, so six months, when does the RN get in and what can they do? Um, well, the IRN probably gets in as uh, the same time as they, not, uh, they did previously, because the RN involvement in the Pacific is dependent more upon the RN having the forces to move into the Pacific because of the Medtra uh, because of the Medtra uh, because of the Mediterranean and the uh, the um because of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. So they probably turn up in which case they are probably involved in Saipan and they are probably involved in the other operations as they were. Remember the British do operations off Okinawa, all sorts of things they're doing in, in the British Pacific fleet is doing a lot of heavy work. There was a very good video I was watching recently which had all the stuff to sort of the British Pacific ended up getting up to, and there is a book about the British Pacific fleet I have somewhere. I think it's... Is it David Rag? What century it's David Rag? Hmm. Duckland, 95. It's also uh, very, inc very inconvenient. Admiral King had very few Brits he considered friends, although I find it amusing he'd rather have a Brit over MacArthur signing a on a Missouri in Tokyo Bay. He really didn't like MacArthur. Uh, let's see. It's Anuk. Uh, where's Anuk? Resume. Anuk has sent an email because Sean has... Uh, I need more bookshelves. I am. I am. There are going to be more bookshelves put in here. There are more once it's finished. But honestly, I need to clear out a section of this office because I've been using it and working in it. And the trouble is, when you're working it, you can't do all the necessary building work. And that's the trouble. It's it's finding time to. So I'm hoping once I've got certain projects out the way and done over the next couple of weeks, that I can then turn around and get all the stuff. Uh, sort of use the spare time to get the rest of the stuff finished off in here. I can tell you what the third renown would have been called. The third renown would have been called HMS Resistance. So it would have been Resistance, Renown, and Repulse as the three as the three members of the class. That would have been the third renown. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Stafford. That would be lovely. Frank Spiller, for any Brits in the chapter, opinion of the Mini Cooper? Uh, old one, lovely. New one? Uh, 
I don't like what they've done with its lights. It look weird. Um, thank you. I, uh, uh, <laughs> that'd be very cool stuff. But, uh, Frank Spider, let's see. Would you trade both Nelsons for six rounds? Mm, probably not, but I wouldn't mind if Nelsons were the uh, were F threes. I were the um, battle cruiser versions. De Casso, would free renowns have had that have had much impact? They would have had much impact, especially if they'd been upgraded as renown had been. If they'd been upgraded as renown had been, and operating with fast carriers, they would have been a perfect fast carrier escort. Huge amount of space for AA fire and enough fifteen-inch guns. No battleship is really wanting going is going to want to be is going to want to get too close to them because. Yes, you'll win the fight. But will you win the fight in the time it takes? Uh, let's put it this way. To get close to an air aircraft carrier, uh, let's say Sean Horse and Nightingale had ha come across Glorious with an aircraft, with a Renown with her. A, they get scared off by HMS Renown later, but let's say uh, they come across Glorious and she has HMS Renown now with her. Even if they decide to stay in the fight, they've got a 15 inch battleship to focus, a battle cruiser to focus on that's going to be blasting away at them. And that's going to be causing damage while Glorious gets off its aircraft. Suddenly, you don't have the suicide runs by the, the by the destroyers, a caster, etc. You just don't. They don't need it. They're protect. They can sort of produce a smoke screen if necessary to protect the carrier while the carrier between the carrier and the battle cruiser while the car while the carrier is launching aircraft. All these things are options if you have that ship with you. The most powerful task force you can produce in World War II is a fast battleship or battle cruiser and a carrier. And if you have two or three carriers and two or three fast battleships, you have a very, very dangerous force. Especially in the Pacific, where the distances work for you. And there is a reason why Force H, when it's originally formed, what's the ship with HMS Arc Royal? It's Renown. And Hood, it's a battle cruiser. Because that's what you want. Keeping up with your fast aircraft carrier, I mean, you want a battle cruiser or a fast battleship. Whatever you're going to call the thing now. So here, tip for the chat. When you click on the top uh, on the three dots on the top right of the chat, you can enable timestamps for the chat. Hmm. I, 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 mm. Let me just check. That's useful. But guy eighty two nine. If the RN had a third renown, what did the other navies get in treaties? If the RN has a third renowned and hood, then the RN has a full battle cruiser squadron. The thing is, they just might not keep Tiger. That's the reality. What the RN might do is not keep Tiger in the treaty. So the RN would have the five Queen Elizabeths, the five R R R Revenge R's, and then they would have the four battle cruisers. They probably still get Nelson and Romney. Whether they go for a pair of battleships or a pair of battle cruisers is an interesting question under those scenarios. But they probably go for a pair of battleships, and then that becomes your flying, your fast squadron becomes Hood and the free uh, the free renowns, which comes a very very scary force if you think about it for Britain to have in the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties, especially when they get to aircraft carrier time. What kind of wrench would be thrown into China's plan for Taiwan if they just lease or sell a bit of the island to the Orca signers? Uh, if the Orca signers would sign up to it, the trouble is how quickly would China try and go, go full invasion in the face of that? that? That would be their only option because the moment they've got troops there, it becomes an issue. 
The moment you have a trip by a four star, it just becomes a treasure. I assume. Hmm. Henry Johnson, Task Force 57. Yep. Dragon and 37. Uh, speaking of Mussolini, what do you think about his plans in Germany to fix the logistics system with the trains? He swore he'd have them running on time. It would have been interesting if he managed it. Uh, Frank Spanner, uh, Lady Golf, Task Force, do they follow Halsey? Honestly, probably knowing Halsey, he would have actually left them there. Because he'd have thought he could take it off with his force, and then that that would have been the perfect thing. Because the reason Halsey does what he does, separates off, is because he thinks the Japanese are that one way, and he doesn't have any other forces to leave. But if he has the British there, he'd probably go, "You guys stay here, and I'll go off hunting." So Laity Gulf becomes a ba Laity Gulf becomes a battle between the Japanese and the British. With Admiral Philip Vian in charge of the aircraft carriers. Oh my god, there would have been an aircraft carrier charging Yamato. You can just know it. it's the Royal Navy aircraft carriers. You know one of them would have been charging towards Yamato. It would probably be the one with Philip Vian in charge of. Yeah, let, let's put it this way. Uh, that's a scenario which is not good for the Japanese. They probably lose a lot more ships in that scenario. But, um, yeah... And that's probably what you have. If you have that running legs and you have the British already there, yeah. John Gunning, think it was Adam F Admiral Fraser wrote a good book called The Forgotten Fleet about it specifically. Yes, he did. It's about one of the few good things Fraser managed. Uh, and Fab, if all four R class have been built as renowned battle cruisers, would it have changed Iron strategy? A six renowns. Um, there were five R class battleships and the two uh, two renowns and. Three, uh, three, uh, one cancelled. So it could have been eight. If all eight were built as battle cru as renowned star battle cruisers, that would have been a very different Royal Navy. Um, especially, uh, you know, if you have eight battle cruisers of renowned star, you probably. The question is, do you have the Admiral class come as battle cruisers? Um, probably they come out as battleships, uh, super heavies like Argentor. Argentor might get built. In which case, the Royal Navy ends up with nine battleships and eight battle cruisers, or maybe nine and nine. Maybe they keep Tiger, but probably not. And if you have eight, let's put it this way: if you have eight renowns battle cruisers, then the Royal Navy is probably sitting there going, "Well, which do we upgrade? The Queen Elizabeth or the renowns?" They're probably upgrading the renowns. Because they have eight of them, they're the most numerous class they have, they're their equivalent of the standards at that point. They're armed with six 15 inch guns. But they are capable of 30 something knots, which means, yes, they are not, they are not as powerful in terms of firepower as the standards, but they can run, to an extent, run rings around them. So, um,. That becomes a very scary battle line for everyone to fit a deal with. How does the war in the Pacific change if uh, General MacArthur is killed in the Philippines or is fired afterwards? Gets a lot more or less egotistical, but probably still doesn't progress in that much difference. So, if Fisher calls the battlecruiser a frigate, how would naval treaties uh, n n naval treaties refer to them? Well, that's the interesting thing. If they are f called frigates, Frigates are, by tradition, not capital ships. So you could claim they were a capital ship because of their weaponry, but they're obviously not a capital ship because they're a frigate. Battleships are capital ships. So honestly, at which point they probably come their own category. 
rather like aircraft carriers. So you probably end up with the battleship, the aircraft, the battle cruiser, and the aircraft carrier category. So you probably end up with, I don't know. You might end up with pretty uh, with uh, the frigate category being based around HMS Hood's statistics, and the battleship category being placed around the various battle uh, the the. Queen Elizabeth was probably one of the American constructions um, statistics, and that would be your stat. Uh, that would be your uh, limiting factors. <laughs> hmm. Night Iron Productions, do you have to sacrifice one of the courageous carriers for the further renown? Or are, again, are we subtracting Tiger for that tonnage? Mm, tiger for that tonnage. If you've got the third renown, you're subtracting Tiger. Uh, Frank Spider, why did Dark Roll not get used in Taranto? Because she was distracting the Italians by doing another operation, a part of the operation. Taranto was, there were, there was multiple options going on, including a convoy being moved. It was classic Andrew Cunningham in that there was Taranto, which was one phase of the operation. There were convoys going backwards and forwards, which was another phase of the part of the operation. And there was Ark Royal attacking other, ba other naval bases. Just in case the Italian fleet wasn't at Taranto, it was at Genoa. Just in case. Take care, Don Shay. Uh, but guys, it's tuned. Do you think, and this is the Iron Brew supply at the moment. But guys, it's turn. Do you think the US uh, should have to give up a class of battleships or, or for a, battle cr a class of battle cruisers in the 1910s? And if you do, what class do you give up? The trouble is, if you give up, then you have a problem with your standards. And honestly, you also have a problem in that what you should be focusing on turbines. So honestly, no, but I do think the US Navy should have focused on turbines. Give me a second. I'll be back. Someone's just popped to my door. And I will get more iron brew out because I think you deserve at least another gla half glass of time. So back in a second. Hello, back. Sorry about that. Just had to say, uh, quickly check on some, uh, someone to come to my door. Um, Frank Spado, if the Germans in World War One just build a fleet World War Two ships per class, we, uh, we've uh, build their fleet with just two ships per class. Does this allow the other navies to compete better with the RM because they all focus on designs, not their numbers? That's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. If the Germans in World War One just build their fleet with two ships per class, I don't think you have the naval race. Let me put it this way. The pressure of the naval race is that the Germans are building a risk fleet, and as I said, are building a fleet to challenge the British. If they're just building two ships of each class, and they're building them as qualifiers, 
There, that's no threat to the British. That's no threat to the British. That's nowhere near a threat. And that anyone, if the Germans claim they're building as a threat, that's never going to wash. What you probably get the British doing at that point is probably laying down four ships or so a year just to keep a healthy, a healthy number, but not too many. Enough. But do we see some of the mass buildings they do? No. And if the Germans build battle cruisers, i.e. at half the rate they build them, so they churn out two or three battle cruisers, again, RN, not bothered. That's really the point. As I said that in the Dreadnought series, the point, uh, the problem, uh, you have sort of two races going on. Because the Germans don't push the RN with technology. They really don't. That's the Italians, that's the Americans who are pushing the tech, uh, are the tech sort of competition going on. And that's what's pushing the British forward to jump, to make those leaps, to go to the 15 inch, to go to the 13 and a half inch, to go to the 15 inch, to go, as I said, to the 18 inch, I think. Um, I'm fairly certain on Argincourt. Because, well, it's either that or they're going for triple 15s. But then where did the treble turrets go? Because they'd have been being built. Whereas, the 18-inch guns appear, but no treble turrets appear. Um, the 15, uh, because if they're sort of, if they're pushing in just in terms of building two each year and it's a tech race, then that's not a threat to Britain. Britain doesn't mind a tech race. Tech race is part of naval competitions. They've been having tech races with France many times over the years they've never led to war they've led to healthy competition but it doesn't break anyone's bank and it isn't super expensive it's the moment you start building a fleet and remember it's not just dreadnoughts the germans are building the dreadnought the germans are building built pre-dreadnoughts and that was part of Turpitz's originally sort of announced strategy which is why the british were building pre-dreadnoughts themselves oh more of them not because of the French or the Russians or the Americans. It was the Germans who were building the numbers. The British were just keen to keep a technological quality of edge. Because here's the thing. you are Britain has to be number one in the world for its empire. That's what it has to do. So if there's a technological race, it just has to be number one. And have a little bit more numbers than there are other people, but not much. If there's a numbers race, then they have to build more than anyone else. If there's a technology race, i.e. with Italy and German, America, whilst there's a numbers race with Germany, then they have to build a lot and of the best. That's what happens. Um... John Shea, if the British were allowed to go, there would be more boarding actions and ramming than gunfire. far. Would it be modern uh, 20th century age of sail? No, they would have been gone far. It would have been, uh, it would have been a naval battle. Uh, not, you know, a boarding action. They don't all try for Altmark. Maybe if some of the ta uh, Japanese ships had been incapacitated and Vian had been ad had been you know, the Admiral in charge, then there might have been boarding actions. Picasso, Renan has rebuilt, was credited with being capable of deli reliably delivering a 40,000 horsepower overload. Was this by accident or design? Or intentional underplaying of hand? Um, by design and a little bit of both. Uh, no, him, sometimes the frigate hood was sunk in Denmark Strait. It doesn't sound as good as the battle cruiser hood was sunk. Just saying. Yes, but if it's a frigate, it's a different category, and the RN might have been able to get more hoods. In fact, when does a ship become a capital of a come a capital ship? When did aircraft carriers and now say nuclear subs? Okay, a capital ship is a unit which is uh, it was technically 
Any ship can qualify as a capital ship, which is said to have a status which allows it to influence events, uh, status and capabilities which influence events ashore. Either it is your principal warfighting asset, i.e. a battleship to fight a battle, or it is your principal asset for influencing uh, 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 events ashore. Therefore, a battle cruiser could be classed as not being a capital ship because she is not built to buy a fight other battleships for a battle to contest control the sea, nor is she built to influence events ashore as an aircraft carries. She is built to provide commerce a reconnaissance for the battle fleet and commerce a protection and commerce raiding uh, against enemy cruiser forces which and surface raiders. So technically not a capital ship. Or at least you could you could spin it so she wasn't. Uh, on PC, you can turn on time and you also know how far, uh, how far behind you are. Yeah. True. But I don't always trust it versus what other people are saying because it just gives me a timestamp. And, uh, yeah. Nine fifty p. Uh, Frank Spanner, Susado. How well do guns stabilize when firing forwards, back as opposed to broadsides? Um, fine. They're designed to stabilize as close to the full uh, system as they can all the way around, and they tend to stabilize quite well. They have far more mass of the ship behind them, and that sounds. So you get far more of a shock going through the hull, but it's usually okay. Frank Spider, what is a popular car in the UK, if not Mini Cooper? Um, at the moment, everyone seems to be buying Fiat 500s. I'm surrounded by them. I mean, literally, I had to go out the house and there was like a dozen. There's a red one. Who's called Ruby? I know, because I know the owner. There's a grey one. There's a black one. There's a blue one. There's a green one. There's another red one, which is, has a different leather trim on the seats. Not called Ruby. There's just a lot of them. There's Fiat 500s everywhere. You can tell you're within a certain distance of London because the sheer number of Fiat 500s. They're just everywhere. 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 Or Volvos. Volvos, there are lots of those. And BMWs, but BMWs are less popular in our area. I don't know why. Tell me answer. Was uh, Sean's question about good contemporary World War I naval fiction writers answered? Uh, I said I couldn't remember names off the top of my head at the moment, and that the trick, the, the advantage thing would be to go but to a previous episode of Bruce, which, which does cover that. That's got, now I've got an image of a Royal Navy Admiral looking at Joan Battlecruiser's impersonating Vicky from Little Brim. Yes, but I'm above all of it. I'm above it. Um, thanks, Manet. So this is the problem with China, then? The numbers of ships being built? Yes. So, what if instead of numbers, Germany tries to come in technology? That doesn't bother the British as much. A techno battle, and I'm now topping up half a glass, so it's the last half glass. Oof. Oof. Yeah. Because there's only one and a half liters in this bottle, so normally I give you a two liter bottle, so it wouldn't be fair to. Cut you off after only one and a half litre. There you go. And that can do for tomorrow as well. Oof. Right. <sighs> Hmm. Numbers competing with Germany. If instead of numbers, Germany tries to keep in technology, that's easy. That's something Britain would quite happily do. And that you would probably see... Uh, you would probably see an incomparable. You would probably see a 20-inch battleship because they'd be building them. Because they, that'd be how they'd be competing. The gun levels would just keep going up each series. And then at a certain point, if they thought war was coming, they'd just mass order whatever the latest design was.
But guy here to know, if the battle cruiser isn't included in the treaties, how does that affect things? If the battle cruiser isn't included in the treaties, or as I suggested, as a separate category, it could well mean larger battle fleets, but it could also mean things like Lexingtons get built. Because battle cruisers will be their own separate, uh, separate category. So if you have it, the Royal Navy's got four battle cruisers, America be allowed four battle cruisers. Um, Japan would be allowed. Well, they've got the four Congos, so they might well be allowed four battle cruisers. But in the and that in that case, then they probably possibly lose out on two battleships or something like that. And you probably get the British. Uh, you probably get a sort of a working out what how many battleships you're allowed. Okay, well you've got a squadron of battleships. You're a battle cruisers, therefore you're allowed. I don't know four squadrons of battleships. Sixteen. Well, sixteen was the end. Sixteen was the capital ships they were allowed overall anyway. So maybe twelve battleships. Possibly they set it at twelve. Twelve battleships. Probably they don't. Probably they set it at. Mm. I'd be tempted. Uh, you see, this probably would be to say that they would actually end up arguing and arguing, and it would end up with being fifteen and five. Because they'd be separate squadrons, and the Royal Navy would go, we want three squadrons of battleships. And you need a squadron of battlecruisers. Which could be interesting, because it could mean that the RN has to replace Tiger and probably, possibly New Zealand, or possibly another one, um, in the interwar period. Because they'd have to replace, those ships might, would need to be replaced, so they could end up with five battlecruisers and 15 battleships assigned. And it could end up with Let's put it this way, it could end up with a whole new added race to it. It could also affect the fast battleship development, because if you've got battle cruisers being built and evolved, or rather frigates as they be termed, being built and evolved, it could change things. Also changes World War Two, where they don't call them frigates, they call them I don't know. You could call them a keep with escort destroyers or they go the hunt class, but they probably don't. Probably would end up calling them brigs. Or swans. But that would be confusing with the black swan style soups. So probably Briggs. Maybe Corvette. Oh no, they have Corvettes. Could just keep calling them Corvettes. Might call them sloops. Escort. Oh, they might call them Briggs sloops. That'd be probably what they would have called them Briggs sloops. And then productions. With the Swift Street class being laid down in September 1945, is there a reason, besides, uh, reason besides will that would prevent the Admiralty ordering another batch of improved town class cruisers, Edinburgh's, in their place? I know you can't predict the small dimensions limiting the uh, small. You can't predict the small dimensions limiting the Fijian Swift Street upgrade options, but it just saddens me to imagine what could have been. No, they could certainly have done. They might have ended up with some 9.2 inch heavy cruisers. That's certainly an option if there's no World War Two. If World War Two is delayed and the treaties as to happen, nine point two inch heavy cruisers start to come out, and then poor the Japan with their older light cruisers, which were they're planning to upgrade to heavy cruisers, would have been in a really bad position. Wesley Phillips, hello. Uh, Re World War Two fiction. A couple I remember about the I come around south of Java by William Atkin, nice seventies vintage, a British novel called Commander Prince USN. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. That's awesome. Uh, yes, they could have possibly gotten more with a frigate, but with the RN. They were they were traditionally able to pull off the golden edge of quantity and quality in one package. Hmm. Add so no, add that. So is a monitor a capital ship or an LPD act? I, I, it can influence matters on shore. Well, actually, amphibious ships are cap uh, could be well be considered capital ships to this day. And monitors are support ships. They are not really meant to fight other ships or do anything other than 
uh, provide artillery, so they don't get many capital ships. They sort of don't fit that role, but, you know. LPDs, LHDs, yes. Jack Ray, what's the cost to run maintain the R-Class lower than the cost to run the key class battleships? Not in the end. Dave Thompson, personally, we live in a ram town. Majority pickups. Most cars are Chevys or Kias. Some mopars, some swords. If I lived in Cornwall, I'd probably be talking something similar to you. Uh, Frank Spanner, what if the USN, IJN, French, and Italy just build real numbers too? Then Britain has a problem, but France can't afford to. IJN and Italy, uh, Italy can't really afford to. IJN and USN don't have the infrastructure to do so. So, and the, you know, that's the problem. If you have everyone building large and fleets, then the Royal Navy will probably maintain the two power st have to maintain two power standard. And that becomes very expensive. But then you probably see things like the Canadian Queen Elizabeth's. Decision. If the French in the 1930s decide Japanese expansionism is a problem, then send the Dunkirks plus heavy cruisers to in their truck. And so that's uh, the so Japanese drive for Indonesia in 1941. It could certainly have made it problematic. I think more interestingly, if they were ordered to withdraw by the government because of the... <clears throat> because of the Germans, I think you might have had those ships transferred, uh, uh, basically whole en masse side to join the British. In which case you could have had a Force Z, which was made up of part French. Old Richard, assuming uh, Sorry stay in power, do you see any other preparations trending up or down on how sleepy? I'm watching things. If they are committed to the new deterrence games they are signing up for, there are certain programs which need to be announced in the next year or so, which could push the budget up, or rather could cause money to have to be reassigned in Ministry of Defence. We'll see what happens. They might, they might push the budget up, because they are looking at things, and the Royal Navy offers... Let's put it this way. The government's levelling up budget and levelling up the inclination seems to offer advantages to the Royal Navy, because there's a lot of shipyards and a lot of places in those areas which they would like to see levelled up, and if you can create steady employment for the next 20 years, you can attract other people to invest in those areas and get them sort out and help them. And shipbuilding is good because it can last 20 years. I'm not getting into the um, pick up debate because honestly, the ones I've driven mostly in the UK are mostly seem to be Australian ones. And occasionally Land Rover Defenders, which don't really fit, the, which if they've been altered for a pickup role are more are interesting. Thanks, Do EU cars not work well on UK roads? They work fine. Japanese cars work fine. Most of these cars work fine on the U on UK roads. Um, but guys, who's wondering, would the USN build the Montana class if they had the Alaska class at the start of World War II instead of the Iowa class? Um, possibly. Possibly, because they wouldn't need the speed. They'd have the Alaskas for the fast escorts. Zoomish. Best all-round car I ever had was... Oh, the end of the... Eh. Mm. clear. If an African nation industrialized at the same time as Europe, how does the scramble for Africa go?
depends what part of Africa they uh, they get and they industrialize. But if we're talking most likely, if we're talking about industrialization, we're talking South Africa, etc. You could well have had a greater South Africa or an African empire of that organized by uh, created by that African. You could have a sort of United States of Africa create itself. Rather like the west, uh, the um, east coast of America, and its industrialization allows for the creation of the United States of America, an industrialized nation in Africa could well create the United States of Africa, especially sort of mm, sub equatorial Africa. It, it, they would be a sort of one, a sort of contiguous zones. I, 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 I couldn't see one really spreading around the Sahara or anything like that. Frank Sonner, Dr. C, didn't Naval Race help develop the car industry much? Um, a bit. A bit, but mostly in the way, mostly it helped develop it by providing a lot of people who had the money to buy cars. <laughs> that was more the advantage. Do you think the RN will get the CDS, and would that be a signal? No more land wars in Asia, etc. It's a new focus. I have no idea. But I do find it interesting at the moment that of the names I keep hearing, and there are about six names in the mix, it seems to be, three of them appear to be naval. Which is interesting. We'll see what happens. There's a Vice Admiral... And two full admirals in the mix, it seems. We'll see what happens. We'll see. Um, Seth Thompson, it look like if a royalist or imperialist gets elected to UK Parliament, what would a 6 to 10% GDP expenditure on armed forces and outreach look like? Um,. That's a lot of GDP. Currently we're at 2.2%, so you're talking about 3 to 5 times roughly it. And that's 2.2% with some creative accounting. As I said, there are arguments about whether it's 1.8, 2% or 2.2. Uh, so you're talking 3 to 5 times the amount we're talking about. That's a lot more force than we currently have. A lot more force and a lot more money. And that means you have to get the money from somewhere, so you're going to be probably not popular, because you're probably going to be cutting other things. Anyway, honestly, if I talk about Africa, I am talking about Sub-Sahara Africa. If I want to talk about Africa North of the Sahara, I'm, I'm saying North Africa. Well, as I said, it, it, honestly, if you have an African nation industrialize, you probably don't... Your scramble for Africa probably turns into wars. And, again, here is the interesting thing. Because if we consider how the British usually works, they don't care as long as the French don't get it. They just want the coal port. So as long as the, you know, like they do with China, etc., they don't want a land empire in China, they want the ports. So as long as that doesn't threaten their ports and their port facilities, i.e. Cape Town, etc., they probably ally with them and help them to keep the other European powers out. Because it serves British interests if Britain has good relations and probably has investment in the industry. Uh, to have an ally down there. Because an ally down there is not a direct threat to British interests. And actually could be a very useful counterbalance to other nations if developed properly. Because remember, the British, the British scramble for Africa is about securing the trade routes to India. Yeah. We, it is that sad. The empire, the scramble for Africa and the empire. That just don't go on. Frank Spiner, don't just uh, see. Could you do a, a stream about those sci fi ships from Bill Trump's? If I did a, a stream for a build from a uh, stream about those sci-fi ships, I would have to get Drac along for it and have to do it jointly. But 
Look, look, do you see an up-and-coming Henderson reincarnation anytime soon? There's only one option, possibly two. Um, what percentage of defense budget is China and GDP from? Uh, <laughs> about four, five. Um, the clock. I thought that historically they spent about five to eight percent in general era, so it was aiming for something similar. Would twelve percent be good? Uh, honestly, not really. Five to eight. you if normally Britain spends between four and five percent GDP. And it only gets higher than that when you are looking at war coming imminently or actual fighting a war. And that's more than enough. Honestly, you don't want to be spending so much on the uh, that much on the fence because you're probably buying stuff which you're not going to use because you're probably going to replace it quite quickly. Or it's not going to be you're buying a lot of stuff which, when it comes to war, is useless. So you want to spend, if I was Britain at the moment, I would be perfectly happy if we were spending 3% of GDP. Especially if things like pensions and war graves and certain sections of R&D and overseas foreign aid were not included in the budget. Because then you'd have about 3% of GDP. You'd have 50% more money than we currently have. With the infrastructure we already have in place, we could afford a, 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 a whole load of extra things for all free services, which would really start to... And this is the point. I'm not talking about getting new capabilities. I'm talking about filling in the capabilities we have. Because we salami sliced over the years and all sorts of things. So... It would be nice to have some extra money to basically go, we'd like to rebuild those capabilities so they're actually, rather than a capability, they are an actual capability. Um, Steve Winish, no one trusts the official Chinese figures. They claim it's about 2%, but there's all sorts of different extra things which go in and out of there. So I'd say roughly 4%. But guys, I don't. Did the future UK and US SSNs being the same after New Australia's bill? I doubt they'll be a hundred exactly the same. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot cl if they're getting a lot closer. Uh, Stop, Thompson. Uh, with what's going on with the world, uh, should uh, is the NHS discussion going on a smokescreen for not being ready for what's coming? Mm, not really. The NHS is something which has. Let's put it this way. Britain likes a certain level of social care and health care. That's, that's part of the deal. You know, we pay the taxes we do, we do it, and in return we expect those things because that's what we're used to. We're used to being able to turn up to a hospital and not have to sign any, fill out any forms. You just walk in, you get treated. We're used to that sort of service. And that's very useful. It's very... St it's very helpful for an economy in many respects. There is, you know, when you're new, young parents and you're thinking about the birth of your child, you're not worried about the costs of childbirth. You're not worried about the costs of a midwife or the costs of a birthing room or any of that or insurance bills. You're worried about the bills from getting the house ready. You're worried about the extra food bills, but you're not worried about the medical bills. That is helpful for an economy, believe it or not. That is very sensible for an economy like Britain's. But it is also expensive. And that is what it means. That, that is what you have to deal with. So the NHS is there, but we do have to start figuring out how we're going to fund things. Not just now, but for the future. And I have, you know, I, I'm looking at the systems and going, we have to figure something out. We do. You might as well do a, uh, eventually do a live stream with Derek. That will be fun. We've done some interesting recordings. I might get him over here and see if we can do a live stream in here. We're both vaccinated. Outside, we can open up the windows. 
set up the camera so it can view us both. Are you how uh, Senate Canary, what percentage of the GP was the Royal Navy in the run up to World War One? Um British defence spending was about I think it was about five to six percent in the run up to World War One. I. I think they had I think it was slightly higher, but that's defence spending as a whole. Uh, Seneca and Stafford, we're all trying to stay fit for that one, but uh, look, we're on a back foot, but the point is, if things kick off, things could go very, very, uh, things will either peter on for ages, or they'll go very bad very quickly, it'll be, it won't be anything in between. It will either escalate dramatically uh, before anyone really has a chance to pay attention, Rather like the uh, French dramatically escalating to recalling their ambassadors, or it will be a ongoing conflict. In which case, expect to see a lot of people get called up. Okay, so enough words. It's a means of social training that the state will take care of things. Uh, yes and no. It. How'd I put this? It's not so much the state will take care of things in social training, although there is certainly a factor that, you know, can be accused of that one. But it's more a case of... We've decided to go down the route that the healthcare is supported by everyone paying their taxes and comes from the tax pool and general taxation, rather than coming in insurance so that everyone gets a high level quality of health care and the reason we've done this as a sort of whole and when you're looking at the nhs and as i say the conservative the right you know if you want to call the right wing approach to healthcare, it works better because it means if you invest in staff you don't have to worry about them getting sick and then not being able to work because usually they will get treated you don't worry about half the losing staff for health benefits because they get health benefits thanks to the state. So it helps the economy out in that respect. It helps up, it takes the, uh, the burn off businesses. And it also helps if you consider the amount of societal disruptions you get caused because of the healthcare debate in America and the inequalities. This is Britain's avoidant. And you have to also remember, finally, the reason the NHS was set up. It was a response, in many respects, to the legacy of World War I and the legacy of World War II. We had a lot of injured people. We had a lot of people that had to be taken care of. You were going to need to have to set up a Veterans Affairs Association, but they had a theory that if they set up something just for the veterans and not everyone else is able to use it, then quickly you would end up with trouble in that the people running the veterans could get away with what they liked because most people aren't using it, it's just for veterans. So it would divide them off from society. Whereas if you set up a general health purpose healthcare system, remember there were different options looked at in different studies and it produces the Canadian, the same report produces the Canadian system, the uh, Australian system and the British system. The British go with the full central control system. Other nations go with a mixture of, per uh, of uh, national health insurance. Or actual, or you know, if you've got the German system, you have a mixture of health insurance and and government to provide and uh, provisions and all sorts of things. They all got their own mixtures, but basically, this is a case of taking care of people. And yes, you can say it puts them safe, but also it's very helpful in the NHS, and it's very helpful when my mum got cancer a couple of years ago. Again, no bills. She had. Treatment at the Marsden, which is one of the best cancer for treatment facilities in the world. One of the best, the Royal Marsden. It's great. Went there, got all the treatment done. No bells. No, didn't have to worry about it. She's put into a private room, which so me and Karen could be with her to take, uh, to take care of her before she goes into operation. She has her operation. She comes out. She had the full, uh, she had um, radiation therapy. 
she didn't have to go for chemo she just had the uh the radiation and um the drugs no bills none at all none to worry about at that point we didn't have to worry about the bills we didn't have to worry about the cost we just had to concentrate on her getting well and that's the advantage of the images the disadvantage is it costs a lot and it goes on your tax bill and that's the thing. That's the other thing. It's not this. Uh, everyone, this is the interesting thing with the NHS. Lots of people, sort of, especially from outside, go, oh, yes, it's the state taking care of you and the state taking control. But no, no, everyone in the UK realizes how much it adds on to our tax bill. We don't mind paying that part of the tax bill. It comes out of my income. It's part of my income tax. Or national insurance. Gone. And that's what pays for the NHS. I know it does. So basically, I consider it's kind of like I, I what I treat the NHS as is kind of a state run cooperative. We all pay in to the best of our abilities and then we all get out. The, we all get out a, a good quality level of care. So it's a state run cooperative more than many in some respects. Hmm. Anyway, why fight your customers who raise your standard of living every year? Well, that would be the sensible thing, but then wars are never started by sensible, logical people. They aren't. They just aren't. There's always various people who put forward the idea that, oh, no, this war will never be started. But wars aren't started by sensible people. And as Carl was pointed out, uh, also in NHS, also your workforce tends to neglect less the periodic test uh, for cancer is free. And that is actually cheaper uh, than, than treating of the cancer. Yes, that's the thing. Uh, you never get people putting off going to the doctor or tests, etc. They go, they get health treated while they're still, uh, while it's quite treatable. So you don't lose your trained member, or your highly qualified trained personnel as much. It's, it's useful in that regard. Miles Mikowski, I feel like the Cold War between the West and China has successfully escalated lately. Is this true? Mm, not really, but it's certainly become more obvious. It's been around for a while. Oh, so it looks like the U.S. has withdrawn Patriot Sands from Saudi Arabia, for Saudi Arabia and that the U.S.N. ships are uh, at a uh, record low for the U.S.N. That would be, uh, that's, uh, the U.S.N. has been pushing them rather hard. They need some work. And as from removing Patriots from Saudi Arabia, um, Saudi does have their own, and frankly, the U.S. probably needs those Patriots elsewhere, man. So being 32, 33, I still have about eight years of service left, according to you. Yes, and you're about two years younger than me. So ditto, my friend. Okay, how would not having a Spanish-American affect the USN and future events like World War II? Uh, it would certainly get rid of one of the USN's key foundational myths of the modern era, and might well have under under undermined their appeals for funding prior to World War One. Thanks about it. Doctor C, good monster movie that makes armed forces look good is Dog Soldiers. Hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Some guys went, a USN size, yep, but that's we take part of the Pacific fleet that can be allocated around China. Mm, they need to be, they, the Americans need to get, take their fleet into harbor and repair quite a lot of them. That's why their numbers are down. They're finally painting some of them. Dr. Johnson, wow, yes, it, that is a huge advantage in NHS. I'm glad that your mum was taking care of them. Well, isn't explained properly here again. We tend to hold Tommy Douglas too high um, to see where it came from, and there is better systems out there. I think a hybrid of yours in the States would work, though. I have often considered that and put forward the idea that if I was designing a system from scratch, 
I would have national insurance actually be national insurance, and I would have it as a national insurance system run through the Bank of England. Or and I would actually have medical care. I wouldn't care. I'd basically go. It can be charity. It can be whatever. But they have to negotiate the prices with the Bank of England, and the Bank of England pays for the insurance as a national insurance scheme, and have it topped up by have the insurance topped up by the government. So it's run as a actual insurance scheme, and we just all pay into it as we are able with national insurance. But. That's if I was designing a blank slate system in the 1940s, knowing what I do now. I would have said that would have been... That, the reason I'd have gone with that is because that would have allowed quite a lot of the already thriving charitable system, networking system in Britain to have hmm, continued developing, which I think would have been quite interesting if combined with it. But they went for a top-down centralised system and... That's what we have, and so nicest way, yeah, uh, barring a massive change in circumstance, no one's going to want to change the NHS dramatically. Uh, Frank Spadon, uh, how about a Trafalgar livestream with Drac? Now, that would be cool. Um, if we were going to do a Trafalgar livestream, though, we would have to try and invite Kate Jameson. We'd have to try and get Kate. The UK, German, French, and Norwegian healthcare systems might be very different in terms of organisation. But in they, they are good enough. You don't need 100%. You need a solution. Hmm. That's awesome. It's honestly 12 years since I've been to a GP. That, see, that just doesn't compute to me because I haven't been to a GP over the last 18 months, but I have emailed my GP on a regular basis. I've sent him pictures of things, and I haven't needed to go deal with them. And I had prescriptions sent out for me, and I've had to pay a fiver, five pounds for those prescriptions to be done. Or my mum and sister have communicated with a GP, and he's phoned them. You know, this is the thing. During COVID, my RGP has phoned my mum and sister almost weekly um, to check up on them and check they're okay. That's what you get. That's a useful system, and at no point have we been charged for those calls. They, he phones, he checks in on them, he makes recommendations, and tries to help. Uh, I'm glad. Never getting sick or lying is helpful, but I, I would still prefer you to have been able to have a, ca a, a checkup occasionally. Well, my father knew he had cancer and refused treatment because he was not going to risk being input. Um, before. Ah, well, yeah. Because he was worried about the uh, consequences of being treatment, let's say. And he's not alive now. Oh, that's sad. Eric Kaufman, the US has a lot of ships and docks of service and getting ready for another surge. Hmm. Frank Farmer, where does the term John Bull come from? Oh, that actually has an interesting story. Now, John Bull is sort of first appears in 1712 in a paper created by John Abarthnot, um, well, a pamphlet called Law is a Bottomless Pit. Uh, it was mm, a sort of satirical treatment of the War of Spanish uh, Succession, and John Bull brings a lawsuit against various figures intended to represent the kings of France, uh, Louis Baboon. And Spain, Lord Strutt, as well as institution for both forensic and foreign and domestic for various reasons. And that's in the history of John Bull and the War of Spanish Discussion. Basically, he carries on and it takes the popular mindset. And in many ways, he is the British equivalent of Homer Simpson. In that he takes on a character far beyond that which he was designed for originally. So John Ball is pretty cool. Although, uh, I'm, I'm sure terribly out of date these days, but um, you know what, who cares? Let me just see if I can't bring this up. Um, settings. Add. Desktop.
There you go. Jumble. For those who are wondering. Hmm. But guys, it's time. Do you think US and her allies will have numbers to fight China? If they have to, they will have to. And they will do. That's the question. Nice is where you don't go to war with the navies you want. You go to the war with the navies you have. So if you end up having to fight a war, the numbers you have are what you have to have. You have, and hopefully you can do the job. If you can't, then you haven't been invested properly. Very funny. How? But how well does NHS help with major surgery? You go in and get the surgery. You don't pay. So I've got him. I've avoided an NHS after a bad personal experience. I think moving to a subsidized insurance scheme rather than a state-run system might yield a better result for less overall cost burden. Potentially, but at the moment, this NHS system is what we have, and it works fine for most people. I know some people have had bad experiences with NHS, but most people have had a fairly good experience with them. And I never have any problems with the doctors and nurses in the NHS. Occasionally have problems with the administrators and hospital planners, but that, that's a different group. So anyway, were there any further impact of the cargo cults following World War II? Mm, not really. What guy is here to know? Besides Taiwan, do you see the US and allies keeping their socialist forces a distance from China and only sending their submarines close to China and doing a blockade? It depends on an issue. I would say Uncle Sam is sort of more of a um it, it's gonna sound strange. Uncle Sam starts from a place more of pride. John Bull starts from a place of humor and becomes the national national navigation. I would say Uncle Sam is designed from the beginning as a bit of national personification, so, um, yeah, I'd say more Homer Simpson. But that might be me being cruel to America. But I like Homer Simpson, so therefore I'm not being cruel to America. Um, I think they moved the carriers and they moved the task groups forward if they decided to push the islands back. It depends what they end up having to do with China. If you have that, if you have that worst case scenario, there's going to be very few. Uh, there's going to be various options you're going to end up pursuing. And pushing your carrier battle groups forward, maybe not within the first island chain, but up to the first island chain, might well help you push back the air patrols, which allow your submarines greater freedom of maneuver in the areas. So that's the issues. Miles McCaskill, Canadian American friends here, can confirm that universal healthcare is much better overall than the American private insurance system. Yeah. That is an interesting question, Bud Guy, it's 89, but uh, uh, how much would a blockade hurt the Allies, American Allies? But here is the problem. If you're already at war with China, the odds are that you were in a de facto blockade, they're blockading you anyway. Because they're not going to be selling to the people they're at war with. If it's come to that bad a scenario, that's what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Too much. It looks like Uncle Sam would clean his, clo his clock in a fistfight. I doubt it. John Balls are heavyweight. Uncle Sam is a very nice is a very nice gentleman and has a very long reach but is a welterweight. He's very skinny, Uncle Sam, uh, skinny Uncle Sam. But it would be an interesting one to watch. Cuz he'd have the reach, but John Bull has the power. So Uncle Sam can try and keep in a distance. But can't inflict much damage. Whereas John Bull, if he manages to push through, bullish, bull his way forward, um, it can do the damage. It'd be an interesting thing to watch.
I don't think rationing will be coming again. I think there is a lot of press talk at the moment which is over centralizing things. No, the nicest way, if you remember back to the beginning of COVID, there were all sorts of press scare stories, and we ended up convincing ourselves into a toilet paper shortage because everyone was buying and hoarding it. And at no point was toilet paper really in that short of supply that anyone needed to hoard it. So I'm sorry. But keep some canned food. It's always sensible to have some canned food. Iron brew dash seems to be in short supply, but that's probably due to the, uh, the, lo the loss of, you know, various um, carbon dioxide production. And honestly, for carbonated drinks and those sort of things, and but again, that's not much of a problem. That's annoying, but not much of a problem. And just you know, if we're running short of carbonated drinks, that's not a world ending scenario. As much as me being about iron brew is probably dangerous to the world, but it's not a world ending scenario. Me and Drac without being without Iron Brew. Possibly world ending scenario, but we, we, we will try and keep moderate ourselves. But it's going to be okay. Just keep calm, carry on, and. My old advice of the pit papers is remember, they're trying to sell newspapers, they're trying to sell headlines, they're trying to make people watch the news. So they report the facts, and they do report the truth, but don't expect them not to put a spin on it, which is going to make it more eye-catching and make you more likely to watch it. Okay? But guy, in a shooting trade war, trade will not happen, and will hurt, e e at least for a short time, the US. Mm -hmm. Allies, but don't think the allies would want to get too close with all the missiles. Probably not. It'll be it would be um, let's say problematic. Uh, Frank Smith, do you consider Shrek a monster movie? No. I consider Shrek a comedy. I'm glad it's made you think, Chris at Stafford. That's what these are the things. They're all their experience. And in the end, as said. I've, uh, as I said, my view on the NHS is that it's a state-run cooperative because we're all paying in to our abilities through the national insurance and through the income tax. And then we all get out quality of care we want. And if you're running a statewide, if you're running a nation-state-wide cooperative, it's probably going to be run by the government. Or alternatively, if it's not, then the government is going to be facing a trouble because it's dealing with an organisation which is as big as it. And on in the end, it's going to sound strange, but that's what nation states are. They accept, they take money in from taxes and in turn provide services, protection, security. So they are kind of like a cooperative. In fact, cooperative. So. Again, this is one of the fun things I have with people when they start using it. They start saying cooperatives are socialist. And I sit there and go through, but all nation states are cooperatives. Because if you think about it, da 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 da. Um, yeah. You can have fun, you know. That's the point of being a lecturer and of being a historian. Think things through and research them. Hmm. Steve, I would say it's not BS to keep military spending high. I would say you have to remember that it takes a lot longer to wrap, it takes a lot more money and is a lot more dangerous to have to rapidly build up military forces than to keep enough for a level of deterrence, an acceptable level. An acceptable level of deterrent i.e. we have a balance of power, so let's talk, is far cheaper in the long run than anything else. And the trouble with when you've got China is they are moving into the system and they want to assert dominance. And it's far easier to balance that than to try and go, oh, we're going to be friendly, friendly, until they go too far and then we start getting upset. 
So that's the trouble. And it almost reached that scenario. I would say it almost reached the scenario where the China had pushed too far and we were all suddenly with our corners and back. Whereas now we're sort of, in a way, pushing back a bit now. And that might make China go, Ooh, well, actually, perhaps we do need to talk. Talking's better. Talking's what we want. Talking stops anything else. But the thing is, the end of the, the, the strongly, era of the strongly worded note mm, only works when no one wants anything else but to draw, draw to be happening. That's the point about the era of the strongly worded note. It worked when no one else wanted other anything. Uh, when all people wanted was jaw draw because they didn't want war war. So, if you've reached the point where a strongly worded note isn't working, you've obviously dropped one of the levers, and I think the West has dropped the lever. And I don't think it's America that's dropped the lever. I think the West collectively has. I think other nations are just as responsible for it as America. And I think, Steve, one of the issues you are... Uh, we are missing is that whilst America has been focused in the Middle East and Afghanistan, all these things, and so have the Western extent, America has cut its military, but to an acceptable level. The European nations have mainly cut lower. And that's what's caused the power imbalance. Hmm. So, yes, in fairness, the issue I had with the NHS wasn't the fault of a doc or a nurse. No. Oof. And a working can opener. I have pull lids on my can, on my cans mostly. But yeah, working can opener is always helpful. Uh, but guys, what do you think will have the big impact on the sea? The submarine or the missile? Both. The submarine will have an impact because there'll be the spaces the enemy avoids because they think they have, there's a submarine there, and there'll be the spaces they have issues because there is a submarine there. And sometimes the submarine will be using the missile. So the submarine can use the missile. The missile doesn't tend to use the submarine. But there again, the missile can be fired from many other things. Hmm. Reverend Razor, could you do a flat iron brew, uncarbonated? Uh, that could. We, we, we might be able to survive on that one. Depends, is it chilled? I'm not getting in the Die Hard and Die Hard 2 Christmas movies. Die Hard, maybe. Die Hard 2, no. Sorry to hear that, man. He's a Eric Kaufman, insurance by definition is a socialist principle. I am finishing up these questions, but I have finished the Iron Brew. So, please note, I'm just taking the last questions. Uh, insurance by definition is a socialistic principle. Insurance companies are... Uh, hmm. uh, yeah, there are issues with some insurance companies, aren't there? Uh, Something now. How many kilograms in a stone? Free stone is nineteen point nine kilograms, or roughly twenty kilograms. So I'm reckoning uh, six point six, uh, six point six kilograms, roughly six point seven, six point six, six point seven kilograms in a stone. Um. Uh, too much. So if the US drops military spending by 15%, it's going to be end of everything. No, I didn't say that. Um, I said that the US military spending is probably roughly right. I said the problem that's reached the balance is the lack of other spending. I heard it a thousand times. Proved wrong every time. Mm, 
Steve, you just managed to shout about what I said and get it wrong. Don't worry, that happens. I said the US is about right. I'll repeat. The European has shrunk, and that's what's caused the power imbalance, because the US has been scrabbling to have to fill in for the Europeans, and uh, including Britain, who haven't been there, as well as covering its own interests. And the thing is, that's, ma that's made others think that they can take advantage of the situation and punch above their weight. And that has caused an imbalance. And that is a dangerous situation. International relations are at the most peaceful when there is balance. Now, the balance is not necessarily completely forced. It's economic. It's a, it's a mixture of things which can come into as capabilities. But the fact is, America can't afford to cover for, cover for Europe and itself and maintain the balance it needs to with a rising China in order to, for, uh, for the world to continue uh, to not have issues. Because either, and here is the situation that happens if you have imbalance. Either one side gets overconfident and thinks they can push things when they can't, or the other side gets scared and then reacts out of fear rather than judgment. So that is your problem. Every time, if you are, you have to think of the, about these things as psychology as much as, fa as reality. It's about the interpretation of something as much as the reality of something. And it's very easy to sit back and go, oh, it's really, it doesn't worry me. But the person who's making decisions might interpret it differently. You want everyone to be making decisions from a position of feeling strong. Because if you feel strong, you're more likely to make concessions because you don't feel that they're going to weaken you. And if you're prepared to make concessions, then you're more likely prepared to talk. And if you're prepared to talk and make concessions, then you're more likely to sort things out without the need for war. So it is about balance, okay? Frank mm. uh let's see. Would you say that they that you need to see that? Uh, what would you say that you need to see that would make you confident that no war would take place? Balance. My friends, I wonder if anyone considered a mine like captor with anti ship missile instead of a torpedo. Mm hmm. They have. Uh, Frank Spencer, have you seen Kelly's Heroes? Kind of like the Thunder Drop. Yes, I have seen Kelly's Heroes. Bad guy said, hi. I hope no nukes are used because the moment you use any nukes, you, start, you let that out the, uh, that cat out the, uh, the cage. And that's not going to be something you're going to be able to put back. One nuke, moment one nuke's going to be used, another one's going to be used, and then everyone's using nukes. The most dangerous thing you can do in war at the moment is use a nuke or even use a ballistic missile. Because if you fire a ballistic missile, then you're betting that people wait around to find out whether the warhead that goes off is conventional nuclear. And the trouble is, they might not wait. They might just launch. In which case, you launch yours. And the world ceases to be a habitable place other than a large pile of glass in various shattered bits. Take care, Sabah Thompson. Glad you, had, you, you, you enjoyed it. Um, see, when people are here complain about foreign aid, being, uh, aid to countries like Israel or Poland, what they ever mention is that the money is actually credit on those countries buying US arms. Technically, any money you give to countries to buy arms is not foreign aid. Technically. Um, they care, Malaysia. It needs to be close enough to identify its proper target. 
Yeah, that's usually torpedo range, but yeah, who knows? Maybe remote sensors are set off missiles. Take care, Paul Berswick. Thank you. Hello, Roland Cash. Tom Garding. Uh, Tom Garding. CB Passum Parabellum. Very true. In the nicest way, sometimes they're not public or private, those decisions. And yes, they can be cynical and evil, but they're not. Often, those decisions are made by people who have got themselves into a fork corner. And that's more likely to happen when they're scared. That is more likely to happen when they are scared. So, you want people to feel strong. And you want people, because otherwise they'll feel weak. And if they feel weak, they'll feel scared. You can. There are two ways to end up in a going down a very bad road fort-wise. Fort and if you think through your own life, it's just the same with you as it is with any person. And remember, leaders of the countries are human as well. When you're scared, you can go down a very ch bad chain of, uh, chain of thought. And when you're... Full of pride and overconfident, you can go down a very bad chain of thought. You know that there are some very wise words, which is, when God wishes to drive us truly crazy, He gives us what we wish for. True. When you get what you wanted, you don't know what you want. You just want more, and that's the problem. So. This is why I come back to this and why I teach the Terence the way I do. Yeah, you know, uh, when I'm talking about it on Twitter, I get into trouble because people go, Oh, you want this big, scary thing. You don't want a big, scary thing to deter. You want to have the big, scary thing. You need the big, hairy group. You need the SSN. You need them back training, fight, uh, fighting, doing the things they do out of sight. The thing you need going forward, that's a Type 31. That's a Constellation class frigate. Why? Because it's not big and scary. It is powerful, it's a presence, it's visible, it can look after itself to an extent. But it's not scary. But you also can't ignore it. It's at that right level. And that is the point about deterrence. The thing is, when it comes forward, you can't ignore it because of the big scary things which are sitting back the other way. But you can't also claim it's intimidating you because everyone will look at you and go, what are you, that, that, that's a frigate. That's a constellation glass. What are you? You know, you, 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 what, you, you scared of that? Yeah, wuss. You know, you, you can uh, if if a constellation class frigate is sitting near, I don't know, one of the islands, going, excuse me, China, you're doing this wrong here. China can't claim that that's intimidating them. Okay, so you have a carrier battle group. No one's seeing you're not intimidated by a frigate. It's just annoying you. Go away, go away. You know that that is the point, and it's. Uh, also, this is why China's buying frigates. The I think they're the O fifty fours. They they are the perfect design for that. That's what they're going to do. Not O fifty fours. O forty fours or something. I, I the, they have. They, I'm sure they have a four in the number. But the 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 Chinese have frigates, which are very good design, whose purpose is going to probably be the presence mission, because it makes sense. It's about the Terence. Lol, do you think anyone in Washington was actually scared of Sam? I just said it's out of fear or out of overconfidence. So, Steve, you don't think they were scared of Saddam, but what does that leave as an option? That they were overconfident. Thank you, Jack Ryan. That's good. You don't give money to buy arms, you give money to free up other money to buy arms. Um. Bad guy tonight. We'd hope not, but you never know. Alliances are strange things about whether or not a future war with Pacific in the Pacific with China would automatically mean a war in Europe between with Russia or vice versa. Take care, Greg Sarsky. That was awesome. My second to last was on account of the Iron Brew running out. I do hope that my better bring them uh, my bugging them leads to a launch it. Thank you. We never we never know. I can't. When I watched the uh, Zumwalt sounds in the viewport 
Rhode Island? I was surprised at how loud she was. How far can a sub hear a surface ship, and what is the range on a modern guy and torpedo? Um, when they're maneuvering close inshore, they often have to have other systems on to make them that make a lot more noise than when they're out at sea. It's amazing. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things I've noticed with ships is when I'm out at sea on them in the ocean, they are a lot quieter than closer inshore. Take care, Nook. Ooh. Thank you, Abelsowski. Thank you, Eric Kaufman. Tell me, Manny6040. Thank you, Grosowski. Frank Spardo, Carl Gasberg, Steve uh, Stephen Thompson. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gummy bears. And um, I should point out, people, on the uh, Sona, uh, Uh, you know, on the sonar stuff, there is often the recorded thing that the British submarines with their sonar can listen to merchant ships going in and out of New York Harbor from the uh, this side of the Atlantic. I, I, I doubt it's quite that good, but you never know. So it's got bow thrusters are very, very loud. They are. They are incredibly loud. Seriously, those things. Yeah. You can get it, it, seriously never be in an accommodation anywhere near a bow thruster. You will not get any sleep when they turn them on. Man. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. And as always, thank you to everyone who's joined the channel. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you to everyone who is currently subscribing because, of course, I have a competition going with my aunt, if you don't know about this, where I have a bet with her that if her family bragging rights that if I get to 13,000 subscribers by December the 31st, 2021, she and my uncle will wear Blackburn Blackburn face masks. And I will get to post a picture of this on, on, on the uh, January the 2nd. Brew ships, so please, thank you, and thank you, Carbo Smoke, Adept Squad, M35 Benvids, Eric Kaufman, Nightmare Productions. Thank you very much, Old Richard. Thank you, Roman Cash. Thank you, everyone, and take care.